I just want to welcome everybody here today to our Interfaith or Worldview Dialogue. And this is our second annual one. We did it last year at UTEP. And super excited you guys can join us and several new faces as well as we're doing it all online this year. And uh, we're hoping this will be a, a fruitful discussion and uh, that we'll be able to listen to others and also be able to challenge each other's views respectfully. And um, so before we uh, get started here, there's a couple expectations to make this uh, beneficial and productive uh, meeting and discussion. Um, total, every speaker has 30 minutes total. Um, to cover their presentation and we'll cover here in a little bit of what the the issues that we want you to address in your presentation so generally you may want to do 15 minutes you maybe want to do a little more a little less but 30 minutes total and that way we can uh, portion out our time um, well and um, be able to manage it so we're not going all day and uh, each, after each presentation you have a q a afterwards which the whole group can ask any question any of the other speakers can ask another speaker a question if you want to type your question in in the chat box, that's fine. Um, if you would rather not speak, um, and we'll we'll try to keep an eye on the chat box as well. Um, while someone's speaking, obviously, different people in this group are going to disagree with things that are presented. But we want to encourage you to not try to unmute yourself and jump in and try to um, correct someone else until. Um, or to respond until it's time for Q&A afterwards. Um, we really encourage everyone to listen actively with an ear to understand other people's views and to not assume or av and to avoid blame, speculation, inflammatory language, which would really be more in the category of ad hominem attacking of the person instead of the idea. Um, I think uh, productive and constructive dialogue always needs to involve um, critiquing ideas or positions in a respectful manner, not attacking persons, another person's character. Um, we, uh, we ask that you don't ask back-to-back -back questions during the Q&A. Um, that way it'll give other people an opportunity um, to ask questions as well. So uh, we wanna avoid it when we come to the Q&A time, only one person gets all the time to talk and, not, and no one else gets a chance. Um, and also please try to keep, please try, please try, please try. keep your comments relevant. If you go ahead and mute yourself, we heard a little, feedback there. Uh, put, keep your comments relevant um, to the topic and I encourage you to start out with a question instead of a statement during the official Q&A time. Um, uh, again, we said you're welcome respectfully question or critique another viewpoint, but don't attack the person. See, um, having a debate is, is a good form and is a virtue if we can do it um, with attacking viewpoints and seeing if they're logically consistent or not. And that's, uh, after all, that's how we understand and discover truth is through a productive dialogue is what we're aiming for today. And again, we wanna encourage you to avoid assumptions about any particular group, um, but ask questions first and clarify um, if at all possible. Um, here is the main questions we want every perspective um, representative of each worldview or religion um, to answer these questions. What makes your religious teachings or scriptures unique? Now, obviously um, not a, some may not have a particular um, scripture, but if you don't have scriptures, consider what writers or thinkers um, over human history have influenced your perspective. Um, the second one is what makes your religious leader or founder unique. And so um, we've already kind of uh, vetted you guys uh, talking about these issues before or to think through what you would present about. So hopefully you're prepared to hit on those issues. And uh, the third one is what else do you think that we should know about your particular position, your worldview? And here is the overview of the schedule. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Uh, so we, won't, we, weren't, we aren't gonna take any time away from you, Raul. So I know we're a slightly bit off schedule, but that's okay. I'm sure we'll um, get back on track eventually. Um, but uh, right before we get started here, I wanna encourage again, everybody to mute themselves and make sure that you are mute the whole time during the presentation and you um, when you have afterwards a question um, after the presentation i will thank each presenter um, and uh, i will help facilitate um, asking the questions either through the chat or choosing which person goes so not everyone everyone isn't unmuting themselves at once so just raise your hand in the video uh, or say something in the chat and then we'll choose you and we'll kind of go from there so all right well raul if you would uh, go ahead and um, you can present first. We just want to welcome you again um, as you're here in El Paso from the 
Tibetan Buddhist Cultural Center, is that correct? That's correct. I'm actually in Juarez right now. Oh, okay, very good. I, I, I was telling you that I, 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 I was fearing that I was not gonna be able to get across the border because of the restriction, restrictions. Yeah. But this was great. I mean, it's great that we can do this online. Yeah, so, um, mm -hmm. so I think I, I'll probably um, try to answer the three questions at once with the with the first one, which is um, what makes your religion, religious teachings or scripture unique? And uh, I do believe that the 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 most interesting thing about Buddhist teachings is the emphasis that it makes on interdependence uh, and this is interdependence of all phenomena and all phenomena includes everything we we're able to perceive and e even things that we are not able or not everyone is, is able to perceive and phenomena is is it's um the nature itself it's uh human beings it's uh other beings are, I mean, like animals or, or insects and, and, and so forth. And um, that means that all phenomena, everything that exists, exists um, uh, co um, generated because there's causes and conditions. And um, so everything, it's, it's involved in, in, with everything else. And nothing exists by itself, by it, uh, by its own side, and um, nothing exists without causes and, and and without conditions. And for something to exist, there has to be a cause, and there has to be conditions for that to to uh, manifest or to exist or to to come to existence. And um, and uh, this it's applicable to. All, all levels of perception and all levels in nature and all natural uh, or physical laws. And um, so if, if we, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm gonna touch the other, the, the second question now, which is uh, what makes your, uh, your teacher uh, or religious leader or founder unique and, and that it's because this all this um, uh, all the, the Buddhist teachings uh, were part of um, contemplation and meditation and uh, investigation of, of and experimentation from the Buddha. The Buddha had teachers that uh, from whom he uh, learned different techniques and different things, but then. Uh, he reached uh, what we call uh, liberation or um, enlightening by itself, by meditating on, on the nature of phenomena. And um, he was, and one of the things that he, he, it, it makes him unique is that he himself said, we should not believe on what he said just because out of respect or because he um, um, or, or because uh, uh, the, the books say so or other teachers say we, we should believe in his teachings but only through experimentation of what he taught and then realizing that it's useful and it's good for us that's then when we adopt his teachings, but not only until we find out ourselves that uh, the teachings are useful and are, are uh, benefit uh, for us. So um, he was an observer in, um, in a sense, uh, scientific of the nature of reality. And uh, also Buddhist teachings make, make a lot of uh, emphasis on, on developing the mind but I should say that the mind from the Buddhist perspective is not our brain and it's not only our intellectual mind, but it's also, it's actually, it's, it's, it's actually interesting that Buddha, for Buddhists, mind, when they refer to mind, 
they don't refer to our head, but they refer to our heart. The, the mind is, 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 if there's a physical uh, repository of the mind, that would be the, our heart. And so when we talk about mind, we're, also, we're talking about our um, mind activity, but also our um, feelings and, and um, goodwill and everything that is related also to uh, human qualities, not only intellectual qualities. So um, the Buddha, uh, another thing that it makes him unique is that everything he came up with, all the teachings and everything he um, shared, it, it was because, I mean, it was through investigation. And um, so he, he invited his, um, uh, the people that was uh, receiving his teachings that to investigate and to contemplate themselves so they can reach the same uh, realization that he, he got. Um, uh, and I, I think uh, going back to the, the, the impermanence thing is that, I mean, uh, interdependence thing is that Everything is originated by something else. It, it doesn't. It doesn't have it out of um, um, random um, laws or um, from its own side. It's it's originated by multiple causes and multiple conditions. And we all human beings are have a a, a role on what what what's going on in the world and this is this is i mean us being here and not being able to eat together in the same place is is something that we should probably contemplate and <laughs> that we all took part of uh, what's going on in the world and uh, that's the beauty of uh, interdependence that uh, we share many so many things in so many levels that this is an opportunity for us to be aware of how interdependent we are and and that everything that is going on in the world and everything i mean globalization it's it's what makes what should make us aware of how interdependent we are and how are we affecting the climate change how are we affecting uh the spread of diseases how are we um, affecting nature in general and, and that's, that's one of the, of the beauty uh, uh, factors of interdependence, that we, we should be aware that everything we do is affecting, is, is affecting everybody else at some level, at some point, directly or indirectly, but everything it affects everything else. And uh, I think um, that pretty, pretty much summarizes what I was trying to say. Oh, uh, I, I would prefer questions from, from the audience to uh, probably elaborate a, a bit more about what I, I was saying. All right. Well, thank you, Raul. Appreciate your presentation. Um, we're going to go ahead and open up to questions in the chat or in the video um, chat as well. So, um, yeah, who wants to start us off here? Anybody? I'm gonna check. You know, I'm here the chat box as well. Um, here, I'll while you guys are thinking, I'll I'll ask one, and maybe you can hit on. Um, <clears throat> I have. I don't know if these are what you consider authoritative. I have on some notes. I have on Buddhism that there are uh, at least four main sacred texts. Is that correct? There's many of them <laughs> i guess four <laughs> collections rather like collections yes um yes, collections. so could you um break those down for us a little more they uh, uh to be to be honest with you i'm not that familiar with everything that it's um um like the um, traditional scriptures okay because we pretty much based on um um There's, there's different schools of Buddhism. And then there's a, 
uh, every teacher or every school has different, um, say, uh, paths of learning. So we can we can probably based on uh, specific teachings teaching instead of uh, um, a book itself or or a, a more traditional scripture, but maybe uh, a set of teachings um, that we they developed the the teachings uh, other teachings or commentaries it's, it's how they it, they're called from those teachings they elaborate more material and then they they share knowledge but basically the the, the main or the core of buddhist teachings which are common between all schools of, of buddhism is the four noble truths okay. which is um the the fact that all human beings experience suffering in, in, in some level and, and suffering it's a it's a tricky word because I, I prefer um, dissatisfaction we all experience dissatisfaction we are always um, unsatisfied by something we are not like 100% happy all all the time so we all experience uh, um, unsatis unsatisfactory um, states of mind and um, the second novel truth is that that um, suffering or uh, dissatisfaction has a cost, which is our constant um, idea of the self that we need. Um, we need things. We need uh, uh, material uh, wealth. Uh, we need. Um, uh, be praised we need to uh, fame or we need to be known we we should have good reputation we have to please our senses and so forth and uh, that idea of everything that we need it's what makes us uh, feel dissatisfied because we don't think we don't have everything we, we would like to have so the third novel truth is that all this uh, dissatisfaction can can uh, cease, and um, and the four noble truth is there's a path that leads to uh, liberation of that cycle of constantly wanting things for us, um, and that's that's the the like like I said that's the main teaching that all Buddhist traditions um, share. The the methods and the different elaborations on those teachings are different from school to school, but the main goal is the same and the, the philosophy is the same. Uh, uh, well, the, the, I should not say the philosophy because it, it, it varies a little bit, but it's, it's, it's very good that regardless of all different um, Buddhist schools and traditions, they didn't, they, they're not against any, any other tradition they're all sharing the same value they're all sharing the same uh, goals and they just differ from uh, their methods and probably the one of the, the or two of the main books that uh, uh, contain books teachings is the uh, Dhammapada which is um, uh, written in, in Sanskrit and the Pali Canon which is written in, in Pali language all, all those two are um, and you call those uh, that. Uh, what was that first one you said? You said the Pali Canon, and what was the other one? Dhammapada. Let, let me write it down. For yeah, you. can you type that in the ch chat box? Yeah. Um, I have one question typed in, and I want to get to that uh, here in a second. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I had one uh, as you were mentioning the, um, I think the Four Noble Truths, and then you hit on, I think it was called the Eightfold Path, right? Um, you mentioned suffering and the solution to that, to suffering itself. Uh, what, what do you, what would, uh, what's the Buddhist perspective on what is the solution to suffering? Yeah, the, that's the, actually the, the, the eightfold, um, uh, path, which is, which, um, says that it, it trained, trained us to have three different, um, set of skills and one is to work on our uh, ethical conduct 
and the ethical conduct is not out of a, an absolute ethics um, set of rules uh, saying this is all this is good, all this is bad. Because going back to the interdependence concept, not everything is good per se, and not everything is bad per se, but it, it depends on causes and conditions. And, and everything has, uh, uh, everything we do has, a, has an effect, but that effect depends on the causes and conditions. So, so do you think that- uh, We have to work on, a, on an ethical conduct saying, we should not cause harm with our speech and we should not cause uh, harm with our thoughts and we should not cause harm with our actions. And causing harm is what it's, it's depending on causes and conditions, causing harm. I mean, if I'm saying something that's true, but it's not the right moment and the right words, I might be causing more suffering and pain and, and I'm be, I might be hurting someone because of my words, because they're not being said in a proper way, in a proper time. And, and that's, that's what it, 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 um, it means that it, it depends, everything depends on causes and conditions. Okay. So the, the, the Buddhist uh, um, ethics, it, it's based on not causing suffering to others and ourselves. Do, but do you said, it, does suffering and evil exist in your worldview? Evil thoughts, but not evil like a, a, like a personification of evil. It, we all have different uh, potential. We have potential to, to do wrong things and we have the potential of doing um, bad things. Okay. And, um, yeah, thank you, Raul. We have uh, two questions I want to get to. And um, also keep in mind, uh, if we don't get to your all questions, uh, we got about 10, -ish, 10 minutes before we move on to the next segment. We, we will do breakout groups with each of the speakers. And so hope you guys will have more time to discuss things as well. Um, yes. Yeah, look, I, I just want to finish the, the three, the three, the three different oh, okay. uh, yeah, set of sure. trainings that we do. Okay. Yeah. And, go ahead. Which is the four novel, uh, the eight novel path is the ethical conduct. And we have to uh, work on our concentration or, or what we call Samadhi. And it, that is the, to train our mind to uh, clean all thoughts and all um, habitual tendencies that makes us perceive reality in a wrong way uh, or, or have a distorted um, perception of reality, which is uh, affected by our thoughts, our feelings, our um, socialization, our culture, and, and so many factors that can turn our mind in, in, in a very confused uh, um perception of reality and there's so many examples of that that like say culturally there's some some things are be that might be good for a culture and might not be good for another culture that that makes an it gives gives us an idea of not everything is good or bad per se but it depends on on the perception of people so that that um how we concentrate our mind or how we focus our mind or what we focus our mind on depend, uh, has an effect on how our mind works and how our mind perceives reality and how we um, uh, interact with that reality. So the, the, the second training is to train our mind to, clear, to be clear of, I mean, to, to work on clearing our mind, our perception. And then the third one is, is uh, it's a resulting thing from the other two, which is wisdom. That this is the wisdom of uh, discriminating what it, it can be um, leading to uh, suffering and what, what it's leading us to um, actual, um, an, a, a state of mind that it's actually benefit for us and for, for everybody else. And that's the triple training that we, we do, which is ethical conduct, concentration, and then wisdom. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, Raul, for clarifying that for us. Um, 
Okay, well, we have one question here in the chat that says, um, how do you know you are meditating correctly? Is meditation is a practice in Buddhism is my yes. understanding, right? Okay, Big time. So, so I guess what's the standard uh, that you would measure if you're doing that correctly? Hopefully I'm asking that right. That's, that's a very good question. It, and it's a, it's a very tricky question because the, the most common, common uh, comment that we receive out of someone who's, who's trying to meditate is that, you know what, I, I quit meditation because I, I never, I'm never able to meditate because my mind is ever, it, it, and it's, it's all the time confused and, and uh, uh, it's going uh, everywhere. Just because of you being aware of that, your, that your mind is distracted with so many things, that's part of the practice. Your practice, and, and there's so many different ideas about what meditation is. And uh, in, in Buddhism, there's two main sets of meditation families. And one is the development of um, calm abiding. And the other one is, is meditation, uh, analytical meditation, which is uh, a big, probably the biggest set of um, techniques that we have. But the main one, uh, I mean, the, the, the first one is uh, developing your concentration your um, single point in meditation or single point in concentration, which is to be able to concentrate your mind on, on something for uh, a determined period of time without distraction. That means if you're thinking about, you're paying attention to your, to, to your breath and then you remember you have to, what you have to do after your meditation, you're already, you're already distracted. But you being aware that your mind got distracted, that's part of the, the, the practice. So you're practicing by being aware, you're practicing being aware. And uh, so it, don't get frustrated because of that. It, it takes time, and, but you will see benefits in, in, in very short time. I, I, I'm, I'm, I can witness that, I, I can. I can I can say that it, you can you can, you can experience. Uh, that. You know, I've heard. Um, uh, was it the, the Buddha said, uh, "Strive continuously"? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, I guess that's that continual striving. Let's go to Justin now, um, and we got about five or so more minutes, and then we'll move to our next segment. Justin, um, un go ahead and unmute yourself there. Yeah, I'll just I'll ask a quick question. Maybe just a clarification. Did you say? Uh, that Buddhism teaches that everything has a cause? Yes. Okay. So then you believe the universe was created, that it had a, a cause, right? It has, a, it has causes and conditions, yes. But I mean, you believe that the universe was created, right? Because it had, to have a, it had to have a cause. You don't believe it's eternal then? Yeah, but the cause of the creation of, of the universe also had a cause. I guess to follow up on Justin, um, something would have to have the power of being within itself, though, right? Mm, I'm not sure. I'd follow. It mean, put it another way, Aristotle would say there, um, there was an uncaused cause because you would have you go on for an infinite regress. Um, logically speaking, yes. you'd go on. Mm -hmm. um, it would go into a logical absurdity mm -hmm. to say that everything. Um, something it has to stop somewhere is essentially I think if I'm understanding Justin right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Buddhist perspective is that um, thinking about this had to have uh, a uh, beginning. That's not something we really focused on. Buddhist teaching said we reality has existed for countless time. Okay, so you for would in, say it is eternal then? In a sense. But okay. uh, it's, I, I could say that time and, and space are um, concepts of the human mind. So uh, we, we, cannot, we cannot say um, there's a start and a beginning. It's, it's, it's just a cycle for us. Here's another question. Okay. Um, is there another 
Okay. Um, I have a question on here. This says, what makes Buddhism a religion and not just a philosophy? Thank you, Eric and Carla Morgan. It depends on what you consider a philosophy and what you consider a, a religion. It can be both. Uh, and, and, and it can be so many things. Uh, but it's a, it's a way of living, basically. And, and uh, the Buddha gave us his teachings, not a, as a dogma of faith, but as a guide for us to find the same answer that he found himself. It's, it's not that it's, it's not a set of rules. It's not a set of uh, mm, uh, requirements, but it's, it's, it's a set of uh, guidance uh, for us to lead our lives. Uh, I, this person, Art Chavez, has a question. He's been raising his hand. Oh, okay. Sorry. I think I didn't see that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a simple question. Um, would you consider Buddhism more of a spiritual religion or a moral religion? Moral? I would say I, I would not consider any of the two, <laughs> but it's more like a naturalistic, probably that's, that's a or, let me Let me phrase that better. Uh -huh. um, is it more about salvation or more about morality? It depends what you what you consider morality, <laughs> because well, I mean, because you said you know not to the the four suffering the sufferings, uh, uh -huh. and not to not to think them, not to say them, not to do them. Whereas, mm -hmm. a, whereas opposed, I've heard of other religions say you know uh, do this, 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 and this, and then you uh -huh. get into a certain place. Right. Yeah. No, it's it's more mostly like uh, recommendations. It's like saying, okay, you want you want this result. You can do this, this several things to get to that result. You don't want this result. You don't want to, to experience this uh, uh, effects. Well, try not to do those things that will cost those effects. But it's up to you. It's, it's not that, that me, the Buddha, it's telling you how to lead your life. It's like, okay, what do you want to do with your life? Do you want to be happy, truly happy, and experience... Uh, um, a mental state of, of bliss and, 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 and lead your life in a better way, more peaceful way, better, better relationship with others, better relationship with yourself and your feelings. Do you want to experience that when you can, you can do this, all these things to, to get to that point? Do you want to be free of suffering completely and forever? You can reach that doing what I did. That's what he said, basically. All right, and I'll and I just, um, just we're gonna go to one more question. Sorry, we can, uh, try to mix it up. Um, do you what do you believe happens after you die? We were born, Re so reincarnation, then, right? Uh, yeah, it, probably in a different sense of uh, other religions or philosophies contemplate um, being reborn. But okay. yeah, it's it's a continuous of a, of the mind stream and, or the consciousness. Yeah. Um, okay, so we are about five minutes off from earlier schedule. We can, um, so we'll do one more from it. Um, just, it just one more thing, Caleb. Uh, yeah, go ahead. It, it, we were born until we reach enlightenment or we reach liberation of samsara, which is the cycle of uh, birth and, and death. That's, oh. that's one key point that I, 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 want, to, I want to clarify. Okay. Um, yeah. Justin, did you want to, I think you typed it in. Did you want to say that? Oh, just, Question. just, just a thought that, uh, just a thought to ponder that um, if, if we do go infinity in the past, right? You said there, there was a cause and a cause and a cause and a cause and it goes eternally in the past, right? Uh, the only problem is that if there's an infinite number, if there's an infinite number of days, if an infinite number of days had to exist before today, then today would never exist. Today would have never arrived if there's an infinite number of days before today uh, could show up. According to, to what logic, Justin? I'm not sure. Well, if you had, if if we went in the past, you're saying that um, that it's infinitely in the past that the universe is infinite. That uh, so it had a cause, and that cause had a cause, and that had a cause, cause had a cause, and it goes back infinitely, right? Mm -hmm. So that means that 
that an infinite number of days had to exist before today would arrive. Like maybe Caleb can help me explain it or somebody can help me explain it. But um, if an infinite number of days had to exist before today, then today would have never got here. So right. You can't, to- yeah, I guess. Uh, um, well, Brian, you're talking next. <laughs> so I think you mentioned in there. Um, yeah, maybe we can pick up that concept here in a little bit, but it's a more, I guess, philosophically speaking on the nature of reality now, because you can't measure like an infinite number of pies itself. Um, the fact that today is here, philosophically speaking, would lend itself that there was a beginning to space, time, and matter, which logically would seem that the cause would have to be beyond space, beyond time, and beyond matter. Um, well, we're going to have to, for time's sake, uh, we're going to have to move forward. So thank you, Raul. Appreciate you sharing with us. Um, we're going to move forward here with uh, Brian Harrison. Um, he's in Las Cruces, and he has a radio show. Uh, he co-hosts with Haley Munoz um, every Saturday at 11 a.m. And uh, Brian can tell you more about that, but thanks for coming on today, Brian. T- t- 10 a.m., but thank you very oh, much oh, sorry. for the show for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, and I, well, one last thing I want to say, I want to encourage – Obviously, I'm a Christian, but I want to encourage other Christians to maybe call in and, and dialogue with Brian and Haley. I think that would be beneficial. So go ahead, Brian. <laughs> we do enjoy it. Uh, hi, as you said, my name is Brian, and I've been given the opportunity today to speak about methodological naturalism. Uh, as with so many other things that have a whole bunch of syllables, uh, it's fairly easy to understand. If our little dialogue today was about who had more syllables, then I would easily win. Uh, so I think that should be our victory condition, right? So we're done. Um, But to break down methodological naturalism, we'll start with what naturalism is. Um, It's the philosophical proposition that only the natural world exists, uh, which I disagree with, which is why I'm not a naturalist. Uh, That fails to address the human limitation. Uh, Methodological naturalism is similar, but it it addresses what I consider one of our greatest failings. Uh, We don't know what we don't know. Uh, It is impossible for me to honestly say that only the natural world exists just because it's the only thing that I can perceive. Uh, I fully realize that there are more things in heaven and earth ratio than exist in my philosophy. So methodological naturalism only says that while we have lots of pen and teller, We don't have any Doctor Strange. We don't have access to things beyond the natural world. Uh, We we have a hard time even defining what that might be. Uh, And so when we attempt to engage with the world around us, uh, then we engage with as much intellectual honesty as we can and with the tools that are available to us. And as supernatural tools are not available to us, then we cannot use them when interacting with the natural world or with anything that we perceive. The first practitioner that we can credit with practicing this type of philosophy uh, was a gentleman by the name of Thallus of Miletus in the 6th century BCE. Uh, I only say that we can credit this individual because we have no idea about very much before him because we weren't so good at writing yet. Uh, It is believed that there were other philosophers before him from which he learned, but we don't even have any of his writing, much less those who taught him. So when it comes to a religious founder or a leader in the school of thought, uh, all we can note is exceptional persons along the way uh, that have brought greater understanding to mankind. Uh, but they are just that. They are just exceptional variants of you and I. Uh, and you know, often says that we stand upon the shoulder of giants. And we're not saying that any one of them was the first giant, just that we're very happy uh, that they're giving us a boost. When it comes to the questions uh, presented to us today for this dialogue, uh, what makes my religious teachings or scripture unique? Uh, well, if not existing is unique, then I'll take that. The concept most people associate with a scripture is antithetical to methodological naturalism. To say that one writing, that one teacher 
is true and infallible and absolutely correct is well it goes entirely against everything we believe in we understand that you know my vision is not perfect my memory is even less perfect my reasoning has a thousand little shortcuts that get me through life easier but yet make it harder for me to truly delve the truth of the world around me so all of these things are a recognition of error and so we have to we have to work to overcome these errors and to say that that any one author any one scripture any one giant upon whose shoulders we stand had it right or reveals it to us uh, would be to ignore uh, that degree of honesty it is at least my personal belief that everything in the past is wrong everything in the present is hopefully a, a little less wrong and hopefully tomorrow will be a little less wrong we're never quite reaching absolute certainty we're just striving for greater and greater clarity as time goes on and if at some point we have a doctor strange if at some point we have access to what you might call the supernatural then methodological naturalism will cease to be but then again if we can interact with it if we can move it measure it manipulate it then perhaps it was just an aspect of the natural world that we did not yet understand so what does it truly mean to be supernatural i, I can't even answer that much less uh, be able to describe it manipulate it or stand a witness to it when you talk about a philosophy um, then you oftentimes have to talk about the you know where the rubber meets the road what does this actually get you uh, and that point of contact has been formalized in what we call the scientific method it is an acknowledgement of our faults and an attempt to design a method to overcome them uh, slowly surely over the course of centuries and millennia as we slowly tear away these misconceptions and failures and reasonings that we have the scientific method uh, is antithetical to scripture itself you are a hero if you disprove what was believed last year so where other religions or where other world views uh, might see a heretic we see a hero uh, it is my hope that a thousand years from now they will look back on what we believe today and shake their heads in pity at our ignorance uh, much like i view philosophy from thousands of years ago uh, and see their failings i wouldn't use the word pity i would try and understand them and see where the tools available to them at the time they did the best they could in their struggle to understand the world around them doing the exact same thing that I do every day I just have a few more giants upon whose shoulder to stand than they did at the time and it is my hope that you know thousands of years from now after a few more giants have made their contribution that they'll look back at me in the same way and, and hopefully with as much charity as I attempt to give those who came before me and that's another one of my failings is I sometimes sometimes give less charity than I should so as far as the, the teachings of the scientific method of methodological naturalism in my opinion the most important is we're not right we are just a little less wrong than we were yesterday and the day before and if we continue to try and overcome our failures in perception our failures in reasoning our failures in philosophy then hopefully tomorrow will be slightly less wrong and the day after that it's about moving forward and as with so many things if you want to see uh, the effectiveness of a worldview of an approach then you look on the fruit of the tree you look to see what sweet fruit it bears and every single one of us right now is interacting on some of those fruits uh, from understanding of gravity of understanding of atomic theory of chemistry the physical sciences of even relativity uh, has a large effect on the fact that we're even video conferencing today um, and this was all been achieved in just the last couple centuries since uh, about 350 years ago we really 
formalized scientific method and, and got down to business. Now, this is not to say that methodological naturalism is exclusive in any way. Uh, of the giants that we all refer to that are household names uh, that you, you see splashed across every history book, none of them would have claimed to be, hi, I'm a methodological naturalist. The vast majority of them were you know, Christian or Muslim or Hindu or of whatever varying uh, philosophical view that they may have had. Uh, it is, methodological naturalism is by no means exclusive. The crux of the matter is, is when it came time for them to truly delve into the truth of reality around us, when it came time for them to, to actually get to the answers, then they adopted the mindset of the methodological naturalist. They adopted the mindset that I'm not Dr. Strange. I have no access to manipulate, measure, or move the supernatural, so I would use only those tools at my disposal. And when you actually use the tools you have on your belt, then you can start building. And that's all that it is. We have no we have no path to happiness. We have no path to bliss. We don't promise, you know, saviors or salvations. We just promise what hopes to be a slightly more accurate view of the world around us to give you, hopefully, a little better, accurate, truthful information about the world we live in that will then hopefully feed into good decision making. And if you find bliss through that good decision making, all the better. That's you know, That would be wonderful. But it's not a moral system or spiritual system. It's simply a pursuit of how do we get closer to the truth through these necessarily tinted glasses and cracked mirrors that we use that are our mind and our perceptions. And my talk is probably the shortest because it's the simplest. Any questions? All right, thank you, Brian. Um, we will got about 15, 20-ish minutes for questions. And uh, so I'm gonna oh, I'll open up the comments here or raise your hand if you uh, wanna go ahead and ask a question. Uh, Eric and Carla Morgan, I'll unmute y'all. Go ahead. Oh, hold on, all right, now we go. Well, I'm just wondering, um, according to this um, philosophy or um, belief, how, how did um, creation or nature come into existence? Well, first off, the, the term creation is a weighted word. Um, uh, how did existence come into existence? It's, a, yeah. it's an excellent question. Um, as Mr. Kleiss was going into uh, cosmological arguments, um, it is useful when trying to wrap your head around such big questions, in my mind, to perceive what we call our universe, uh, to, to qualify it as you know, our local universe. Uh, much like as a methodological naturalist, I can't comment about anything outside of nature because I don't have access to it. The same goes for our universe. We don't know if anything exists outside of what we see as our universe or if it doesn't. We, we simply don't know. Are, are we nothing but a, you know, but a soap bubble uh, on a vast ocean of foam? Who knows? Um, all we are presented with is, is what we've got. Uh, where it came from, we can trace back to to a long, long time ago, down to a picosecond uh, after uh, an expansion of space time. But what came before that, I don't, I don't know. Well, I'm just wondering about life. Like, where did the first ribosome come from, and how did I mean, how did how was that? How did that come about? Uh, that's the the question of abiogenesis. Um, it is a, a very interesting field. Uh, and while we don't have the answer, uh, because we, we simply lack the ability to go back in time and perceive how it happened in our case, uh, we have created um, RNA sequence, well, precursor protein sequences that would be necessary for RNA. Um, we have created them in laboratory settings. Uh, they took what they thought were the primordial stuff uh, put it in a chamber, added a little lightning to it, and protein spontaneously formed out of, out of uh, chemical interactions. 
someone else said, no, 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 that's all the wrong stuff. You know, it looked more like this. And they did the experiment and they formed proteins. And then someone said, no, 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 you're both wrong. The thing here is, is every combination they tried all produced proteins out of random chance. Well, I can't say random chance. Random's a loaded word. Out of the existent circumstances that they hypothesized were our primordial Earth, every single one of them produced mm -hmm. precursor proteins, the building blocks of RNA. And unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to conduct a million year long experiment in chemistry, um, but we were able to create the, the building blocks. The, you know, so do we know exactly how we got from there to here? We, we only have the vaguest of maps and we, we certainly can't give you a step-by-step -step process, but it's very promising in the fact that, you know, try as hard as we might to put a thousand different combinations in there, they, they all produce the fundamentals. Um. What, what I learned when I studied microbiology and is that, I mean, you have your adenosine, your thymine, your guanosine, those make up one amino acid and normally it takes about a special combination of about 20 of those to make up an amino acid. Mm -hmm. And to me, uh, it's just hard to conceive of the odds of those coming together to form one acid, let alone to form a ribosome, um, which would which would bring about life to me just seem that's, a, that's an excellent it's an excellent point uh, and that puts me into one of my favorite examples um, if you would be so kind as to do, do me a favor and just in your mind uh, imagine a common household item a deck of cards uh, get rid of the jokers get rid of the manufacturers cards just your standard 52 um, and shuffle them up in your mind cut them a couple times shuffle them up again until you are absolutely certain they're the, the most random deck of cards you could ever have. Then in your mind, spread them out in front of you like a Las Vegas dealer with the faces up and take a quick glance across at the order of every suit and every card. The number you, the, the combination you have just created, there are more possible combinations of that 52 decks of cards than there are seconds since the Big Bang. You could have done that 10,000 times a second since the moment of the Big Bang and still not gotten them all. When it comes to uh, astronomical odds of something happening, absolutely. It's difficult to wrap our minds around. But uh, as you are well aware, look at how many trillions of chemical interactions are taking place just, in, just within the confines of your body every passing second. Uh, yes, trillions upon trillions uh, would be needed for something to bump into each other to make it just right. But we had billions of years and trillions stacked upon trillions of opportunities for it to happen. And all you needed was for one set of uh, proteins to come together for a series of amino acids that had the capability just by nature of their structure, of their chemical interactions, to create another. As soon as you have that moment, the rest is just adding time. Yeah, well, um, I, I don't know if it would be beneficial, but to have a ribosome, actually, you have to have the RNA that, that reproduces it, which is a very interesting thing because not only you have to have the ribosome, but the DNA slash RNA at the same time period. Because if all I produce is an RNA, a ribosome, it can't self-replicate -re itself, it will disappear. Entropy will reign. If I have the RNA strand and no ribosome, it cannot reproduce itself. So there are quandaries. I, I appreciate again that, that, that there, there clearly is an attempt to understand using the scientific as far back. Um, but but it, does, it, it does sound like again that there comes points where where there's going to be limits to what we know. I, I absolutely agree. And I guess my question to you would be, when you hit those limits, what do you do? Do you just put it in a parking lot, move on with life? Uh, uh, that, that really kind of depends, um, especially in a, in a difficult problem like abiogenesis. And obviously, you have far more education on the topic than I do. Um, you know, I, I spend time with biochemists. I'm not one myself. Um, 
the sometimes by for continuing to explore that that I don't know, you, you can find the hook, the thing that leads you to the next point. In other yeah. situations, we've had to have certain problems uh, set aside for a thousand years until someone else you know happens upon the discovery that that makes it possible to move on. There's a reason why you know we didn't solve biology in the course of a year. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it takes centuries and sometimes you're going to have someone that comes along and finds the next piece of the puzzle a hundred years later and they're going to pick up your I don't know and say well well heck I, I actually have a chance to, to figure this out now. Um, but like I said we we've got a whole lot of I don't know. We've got a whole lot of stuff we're wrong about. Hopefully tomorrow we'll be slightly less wrong. All right. Well, we're going to move to a couple other questions here. Um, I let that go. Eric is a medical doctor, and so I enjoyed the conversation. Um, and uh, so thank you guys um, for your comments I there. I the questions on it. <laughs> yeah. He obviously knows more than me. Um, always learning. Uh, we have Tim who said, how does methodological naturalism account for immaterial laws since the scientific method requires something to be observable? Okay. The follow-up question is, what do you define as an immaterial law? Do you want to unmute yourself, Tim? Or if you want, you could type in. It doesn't matter to me. The right, laws ahead. of logic. Uh, the laws of logic are necessary presuppositions which are reinforced by observation. Um, so here's where you get into – there are two types of laws. There are descriptive laws and proscriptive laws. Uh, a proscriptive law is thou shalt not go above 55. Um, there's something that we determine. Uh, like oftentimes an apologist will say, we well, can't have a law without a lawgiver. Well, it's true, you can't have a proscriptive law without a lawgiver. Uh, a descriptive law is uh, a law of observation. It is something that has been observed so consistently as to appear immutable as far as we can tell. Uh, and philosophers, in their desire to dive down uh, into the infinitesimal uh, and nitpick at absolutely everything, um, you know, thanks to you know Aristotle and philosophy you know, and uh, Socrates, whether or not he existed, uh, these were the three things that they that they could not boil past, and they are the three fundamentals of our reality that so far appear to be immutable unless you get into quantum physics. Everything breaks down in quantum physics. I mean, who, who, who the flip knows? Um, so yes, the law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, the law of the excluded middle. You know, a thing is what it is, a thing isn't what it isn't, and it can't be both is and isn't right. um, in the same way. So you have um. to put on that context. Uh, but, but, they're, but those are descriptive laws. Uh, they are not proscriptive laws, and they are just they are just constantly reinforced by absolutely every interaction we have in the course of a day. Uh, if you find something that breaks all laws of logic, uh, that you know that something is and isn't in the same context, then then yeah, that that stuff's going to break down. But people have been trying for millennia to do so, and we haven't yet. And of course, I have to say yet because I don't know what tomorrow brings. It seems like they're laws because they're consistently shown to be true. Uh, the laws of logic, well, I guess as a follow-up to that is um, the ability to discern truth as in the scientific method, the ability for humans to reason in general. Um, you said a scientific method runs contrary to the Christian worldview. Um, uh, no, I said, I said scientific method runs contrary to the concept of scripture. Okay, um, I'm not sure. What do you mean by that? Uh, scripture, in in many contexts, is seen as revealed truth. It is seen as an unassailable guide uh, to which, which is the foundation of understanding. Um, and methodological naturalism and the scientific method is far more about here. Let me tell you what I've discovered, and you try your absolute best to knock it down. Because if you knock it down, then it wasn't strong enough, and let's build something stronger. Um, whereas uh, in many religions, the attempt to do that is seen as a stoning offense. Um, so 
you know, obviously some people are going to see scripture differently. Uh, everyone's going to, I mean, religion is in many cases an intensely personal thing, uh, as is their interaction uh, with their scriptural texts. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm speaking in more of a broad general term there. Um, it's certainly not everything to everyone, uh, but in, especially in my upbringing, you know, how I was presented uh, the scripture was that it was unassailable. Uh, and, and that is antithetical. To, Did you grow up as, uh, with a Christian background, Brian? Indeed. I, I grew up in General Baptist Church, and then my parents moved across a number of denominations trying to find their quote-unquote church home. And so I, I got exposed to, to several different ways to go about it. Uh, my parents pulled up just shy of snake handling. Hmm. Interesting. Um, well, I guess what I was meaning is the ability to reason and come to consistent conclusions in nature, meaning the uniformitarity of nature, that it's consistent, like the sun is going to set and rise every day. Um, according to mythological naturalism, um, how, how do you account for that is, I guess, the related question to Tim's question. Um, like, I guess there's attempt, two questions, I'm really. To, I'm, how I'm can you reason? The difference. I'm attempting to discern the difference between accounting for something mm -hmm. and accurately describing its reliability. Sure. Um, let me rephrase. How can you... How can you have your own ability to reason? As in, how can you trust your thoughts if methodological naturalism is true, if your thoughts are the result of chemical um, accidents over millions of years? And two, um, why is the say, nature so accidents? It's, you're, 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 you're belittling the, the process by calling it an accident or by calling it random or calling it a tornado in a junkyard. Well, I didn't say tornado in a junkyard, but well, no, th I'm just saying these are very <laughs> common euphemism used to, to belittle and call something random when it's not. It's a, it's a constant trial and error. Uh, and sometimes something succeeds, you know, it's okay. But, uh, but as far as how do I find my, my reasoning to be reliable, mm -hmm. um, the simple fact is, is sometimes it isn't. Um, and the, the true test of that, the true test of my perception, of my reasoning, of my interaction, is when it gets put up against the test of reality. Because, you know, as so many people will say, reality doesn't really care what you think or what you believe. It's going to be what it's going to be. And so um, I have a degree of reliability upon my, uh, my reasoning in proportion to how accurate it goes to reality. And I try every day to, to strive for greater accuracy, to, to more closely fit the real world around me and not, and not my own mental facility errors. Yeah, as a, as a Christian, I guess I could agree in the sense that um, I think truth is that which corresponds to reality. I don't, I don't know if you agree with that. That's a classical def definition. Of yeah, truth, I, that, I that had a hold to the classical. Reality. Yeah, and I think that's what we should, the, the goal of this conversation is refining through dialogue what is true and what is not and um, corresponding our views to reality. Uh, Mike's had a, Mike Moss had a question. He raised his hand a while ago, so I want to get to you. Um, Mike, did you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, just quickly, um, uh, he indicated, or Brian, you indicated that um, you believed that we were wrong in the past or more wrong in the past and that your hope was is that as time went on, we would get more right. In a very general sense, yes. Yeah, and I was wondering, how do you determine what's wrong and what's right, and what what makes you believe that we're moving in a right direction rather than we're actually moving in a wrong direction currently? Well, as I said, uh, it's it's largely the fruit on the tree. Um, for instance, uh, when it comes to uh, relativity and special relativity. Uh, we we didn't really kn know just how good our understanding of that was. So when we put up our first GPS satellites, they weren't sure what type of timekeeping to keep on there because everything has to be kept sync in clocks. So they sent them up with two sets of clocks on them. One uh, was a static clock which would uh, not adjust for relativistic time dilation because those satellites are zipping around pretty quick enough that minute differences in the passage of time would accumulate. And then they set up another set of clocks uh, on there that would account for that speed. 
And then uh, they put them up there, they got out their GPS devices, and they started noticing that on this clock, the accuracy kept drifting farther apart, but on this clock, it was maintaining precise. And that was the, the, the clock that accounted for, uh, for general relativity. And so how do we know if we're getting closer to the truth is we test it against reality. And you know things like relativity are, are exceptionally esoteric and they're not things that you and I in our everyday activity are gonna have access to actually interacting with and testing. And so sometimes you gotta do weird stuff. And this is one example of, of the links to which we, we really have to stretch to figure out if you know if, if truth is that which comports with reality how in the heck do we compare it to reality uh, and, and everything you see and do today uh, if you were to go to with a turn of the millennium understanding of the natural world uh, nothing that we're doing today would have even been possible we, we simply didn't have the proper understanding and since this stuff works then we're getting closer at least Okay, so then I guess I was reading more into the terms right and wrong. Uh, you're just you're you're talking more in terms of accuracy and knowledge and yes, and in in understanding the world around us. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right. Well, we're it looks like we're coming up on a break. Uh, Justin, last question. Really, Justin, yeah, go ahead, Justin. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Justin. And yeah, we'll just, just real quick, we probably talked about this before in the past, but. Um, I know that you don't have a, a worldview, so I won't use that. Oh, no, uh, I would definitely say this is a worldview, yes. You would say you had a worldview, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, it seems that your worldview is dependent upon the laws of nature being uniform, that the past will be like the future. So um, you're, you're using the scientific method to arrive closer to truth, but the scientific method uh, that you're using seems like you're presupposing law of natures that hold constant, that the law of, that these laws of natures will be the same tomorrow, that tomorrow gravity will be the same, and that um, uh, the laws of nature, that these universal laws of nature that we know are gonna hold constant um, far in the future, and that's how we, uh, what you presuppose. But um, it seems to me that when you're presupposing laws of nature being uniform, uh, consistent, that they're gonna hold, uh, be constant, that you know, the past is gonna be, that the future is gonna be like the past, um, I wonder how you arrive there uh, by purely methodological natural processes. How do you know tomorrow is going to be like the past? And, well, if your answer is, and if your answer is because the past has always been uh, like the future, I don't, I don't see it. See, it seems to me that, um, and I, I know that uh, it seems to me that you have to uh, borrow from a Christian worldview where there's, where there's uh, someone holding these laws of nature that exist outside of us, holding them constant. You're presupposing that. Um, so it seems like you have to borrow from the Christian worldview to even do science. And I'll just drop that there for you. Yep. And that's why I made certain that uh, I was very clear about the difference between a prescriptive law and a descriptive law. Um, we, there is, as far as I can tell, there is no one saying thou shalt only go 55 miles an hour. We can, oh, we just see that nothing is going faster than 55 miles an hour. And yes, I, while I cannot claim absolute certainty in anything, I can gain a growing confidence in the consistency of it because I have yet for gravity to fail me for even a blink of an eye. Uh, and I've jumped out of airplanes. Um, the, the same with the, the sun rising tomorrow. Even when hidden by the clouds, I have other, other evidence that it continues to do so. Um, it is at no point am I claiming absolute certainty and nothing about well, in my opinion, a properly intellectually honest methodological naturalism would never claim absolute certainty on, on well, any topic. Are you uh, certain about that? I, did I not just say, in my opinion? Oh. I, I, I thought I sufficiently qualified that before making the statement. Uh, so, so if at any point gravity fails me, then I will reevaluate. Uh, in the meantime, um, I'm going to continue to go with it just as it continues to be reliable. All right. Well, we're right up on a break, guys. Um, we're going to do about 10 minutes. You can go get a coffee break or go to the bathroom or whatever you need to do. And then we'll pick up with uh, Abrahim. Uh, welcome, Abrahim. I know you joined us just a little while ago. And uh, so we'll probably be right around 335. Uh, we'll regather and uh, we'll pick up from there.
Okay. All right, welcome back guys from our break. I'm enjoying the discussion so far. And uh, next up, uh, we have two speakers and our, our immediate one coming up now is uh, Abrahim from the uh, Islamic Center here in El Paso. So he's going to also be sharing about the religious texts and uh, um, also breaking down um, their worldview as well. So uh, if you guys could give uh, him your attention now. Uh, Salam alaikum everyone. Salam alaikum means peace upon you. Uh, just like uh, I'd like to let you know in the beginning, like I I will ask your permission to leave after this because I have another meeting, if you don't mind. And I am giving you a heads up in order if you need to ask any question, stop me and ask. There is no problem. Okay. Bismillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Bismillah means in the name of God, the Creator. Okay, uh, in order just to understand the, our view to the religion, uh, I have to go a little bit back uh, up to Adam. When Adam was created, uh, the Muslims see every human being on the earth is brother and sister, is from Adam. And when Adam was created in paradise and he received the order not to eat from the tree and he did violate this order, as a consequence, he was kicked out of paradise with this new world like to go down to the earth uh, as God, the creator, guarantee for him the food and the life. He guarantee for him also the guidance and this is the religion therefore the view of the muslim to the religion it's just one religion uh, messenger after messenger coming to lead us to lead the human being in general to the right path the path which the god uh, uh, told adam if you follow you come back to paradise and if you don't follow you will be in trouble and this is very clear historically and uh, uh, like religion wise you will find it very clear like in the story of the ark for example prophet Nuh came to the people informing them about they should worship god and leave uh, other uh, like idols and anything to be worshipped other than God. And they didn't, like, those who listened, they were saved in the ark. Those who didn't listen, they were destroyed in the flood. And God informed us in the scripture, uh, like uh, in the Old Testament, in the New, and in the Quran, about this, like, if you listen and obey to me and my message, you are saved. If you don't, you are in trouble with God. Because it's not equal. Someone who care about humanity, care about people, saving life, and someone killing life and destroy humanity. Therefore, the religion is considered as a constitution from the creator. Constitution from the one who created the earth to tell you how to live your life on the earth and those who follow the constitution in every generation in every nation they were saved like the true follower of moses they were on the right path and after moses left jesus came to correct them and to bring them on the same path like moses like abraham before and uh, some accept and some reject and this is the case always the human, like the human being will be split between those two those who really like love and obey the creator and those who does not care does not care because of the temptation of this life does not care because of the material life does not care because they have um, you can say uncertainty about 
is really like God is exist or not exist. Uh, but in general, they don't care. And God, as he said in the Quran, uh, chapter 2, 256, like the right path is clear from the wrong path. And whomever follows the path of God, he grasps the like uh, right path. He's holding to the right path. And uh, it is like uh, for us, as I said, all the prophets coming or choosing by God, uh, they are in the right path. Like Abraham came with a beautiful message. And after he left, Moses came with a beautiful message. And after he left, Jesus came with a beautiful message. And you can name many prophets and messengers, as you know, from the scripture. All of them on the right path. And is not contradicting each other. It's completing each other. Like, as I said for you, Moses, uh, Jesus, when he came after Moses, he said, I'm not coming to destroy the law. I am coming on the same law, like Moses. Therefore, he is coming with the same, uh, how do you say, the same foundation, which you have a creator, and you have to listen and obey to this creator. Uh, if you don't listen, you have the free will to choose whatever you like to choose. But for sure, you will go back and you will be asked about your life. Those who are having everything, for example, they are in test. And those who don't have, they are in test. Every human being in test in this life, 60 years, 70 years, your claim you do love God and you do love the Creator will be tested during this time. And you will be, uh, because as you know very well, like many of us claim, we love God, we love God, but in the first chance of violating the law, we violate the law of God. For example, God gave the order to give it charity. Many of us, when it comes to money, we are greedy. Therefore, we violate the law. Many of us feel like he's better than others. Therefore, like all of this, as I said for you, is just like you will be tested through a station in your life. And this station will prove your claim is right or not. Because it's easy. The lip service is easy. Everyone claiming he's like uh, believe in God, everyone he claim he, he love God, but like in the end, the, all of this claim will be judged by the creator himself, not by the, not by the human being. We are not allowed to judge each other in this life. We are we allowed to correct each other. We are allowed to say, you know, uh, according to the law of God, this action is not good and this action is good. But we don't judge. The one who will judge is a creator. Because as I said for you, no one knows what is in the heart except the creator. Okay? Uh, this is like the general view about the religion for Muslim. All, the, all those chosen messenger from God coming for us with instruction, with constitution, telling us how to live this life. Like, this life is just like a matter of test for you in order to prove you are good to be entitled for eternal life in the hereafter or not good. And the standard of good, as we said, is not my standard, is not your standard. It is a standard which God put in his scripture, in his law. This is the standard of good. Uh, in order to be Muslim, just like you have to believe in those five pillars. If you accept them, you become Muslim. The first one is to believe no God deserves the worship except the Creator. And to believe in all his messenger, Muhammad, Jesus, Moses, David, Suleiman, all of them. 
Why? Because they were chosen by God. Second, to pray five times a day. And the prayer is a connection between you and the one who created you. And this connection is always like to make you conscious about the creator, to let you go back and to check your action and to know if you did something wrong, to correct it. Because you will be questioned about it in the day of judgment. Okay? After uh, this, like the third uh, pillar is if you have saving, you give charity. And if you don't, it's not an obligation. And the supervision is not for anyone. The supervision is for the creator. Like if you said, like, I don't have, and you have millions of dollars, no one will tell you, 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 you do have. It's between you and your creator. If you have saving, you give. If you don't, you don't have to. And this give, like whatever you give as a charity, it is from your hand to the hand of the needy and the poor. Means you are the one who judge who deserve it and you give it to him. And the fourth one, which is um, like to fast. Fasting is just like a month, 30 days for us. And it's focus on uh, your soul and live your desire. Uh, the fifth pillar is pilgrimage. Pilgrimage to Mecca, to visit Mecca. And uh, visiting Mecca is to, uh, the reason for Mecca, Mecca was the first house to be built on the earth to worship the creator. And it was built by Prophet Abraham. Uh, this is like uh, just a quick overview for the Islam or, or for the religion in general and uh, Islam in particular. Uh, after this, like, uh, why, like, uh, uh, I will say, like, why you think uh, your religion is unique? It's just, it takes the authenticity from the book. And the book takes the authenticity from the one who revealed it. Means, a book, I write it by my hand, is not similar to a book, for example, I will say, like, uh, President Trump wrote it. For sure, like, President Trump, he should have like more weight because his experience, his reputation is the same. A book the human being write it down is not like a book the creator sent it to us. Therefore, the authenticity of the religion is coming from this perspective. The book which we are depending on is revealed by the creator to the human being as a constitution to tell them how to live your life and to tell them like uh, what is good and what is bad in this life and to ask them to give everyone his rights your wife your kids your family your neighbor you have to give everyone his rights and in in the book saying like we will be gathered for the day of judgment all of us and everyone will be held account according to what he did. Means those who did plan it good in this life, those who did good in this life is not equal to those who did bad. Therefore, there is a day everyone will be judged by the creator. And in this day is uh, like the king and the president and the janitor, all of them are equal front of the creator and all of them will be held account according to what they did in this life. Uh, this is just like a very quick uh, overview. I will, uh, I will open the floor for a question. All right, thank you. Um, we got a couple of questions here in the comment. And if you guys want to clarify those on the video, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I'll start up here chronologically. Um, we have one from uh, Matt H. Um, 
it says, um, how is judgment made by God? If you break the law event once, wouldn't you be judged guilty? Or is that a matter of doing more good things than bad? And that's in the chat box if you need to see that. It's like, I guess, kind of three questions there. It's okay. Uh, okay. Is that like there is two rights, or there is yeah, you can say two rights. The rights of the creator means like the prayer, the fasting, which something between you and your creator. And this is is very easy to be forgiven. It's very easy because God. Uh, <coughs> Like he didn't mean like to punish us by putting the law. He just meant to give everyone his rights. Therefore, I guess maybe I can help clarify on that one. I think I'm not sure if I understand, and maybe if I misrepresent their question, they can correct me. Hopefully. They can speak if they would like to. Yeah, I don't know if they want to clarify because what I was thinking is how do you how do you know if you've done enough? Or go, or go ahead, Matt. I think he unmuted himself. Yeah, sorry, guys. That's why I was uh, typing it because I've got a four-month-old scream in the background. But yeah, I guess my question is, so uh, there's law and there's a deep sense of right and wrong. And so when we talk about uh, making it into paradise, what's that determination? How does God make the determination whether or not, or the creator make the determination whether or not? Um, you deserve to go to paradise. Is it is a matter because obviously we're going to break the law, right? I think you acknowledge. Yes, we, yes you we, said, will break the, we will break the law for sure. So is it a matter of all I have to do is pray and ask for forgiveness uh, in order to justify uh, and get forgiveness of that, and then be allowed into paradise, or do I have to do some other things as well? Is it a no. balance? No. As, as, as I was going to the right direction uh, in the answering your question, there is two rights. Rights between you and your creator, and this is very easy to be forgiven, as I told you. Like, just by seeking forgiveness, he will forgive you, if you are sincere, for sure. Okay? But the other rights is the rights between you and the human being. Like, if you steal money from your neighbor, for example, if you did something bad to your neighbor, here you have violating two rights, the order of God to be good and the order uh, and the rights of the human being. Right of the human being, it will not be forgiven until the human being himself forgive you or you return back whatever you take from him as rights. You see what I'm saying? Therefore, it's not sufficient, like for example, uh, you are a religious leader and uh, you are asking forgiveness and uh, you spend your life in the church or in the mosque is not sufficient for you until you return back the money you stole from the people until you give everyone his rights is not sufficient okay and if you do your best to seek the forgiveness and to return back the rights, at this moment, God will judge according to your sincerity. How much you're sincere, like try to return back to the rights of the people and how to, like how much you did good in this life. Okay? In the yeah, end- Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but, but what if you were to die before you were able to make restitution or fix that? Uh, you know, to, to make it right with your neighbor. Okay. Do you have the intention or you don't? This is, this is make big difference. Like, for example, someone saying, you know, when I, when I reach like 60 years old, I will start to fix with God. No, this is not good. You have to be fixing because like every human being has to fix with God all the time. Why is that? Because we don't know when we will die. I could die before I complete this video or this uh, presentation, correct? If this is the case, I have to correct myself all the, uh, myself all the time. But like to, to live your life according to your desire, 
And when it comes to the moment of death, to say, I, I decide to fix it today, this will not be accepted. Okay, thanks for that and answer. This, we got a couple other questions I got to get and to. This is, uh, oh. And this is uh, clear in the Quran, by the way. It's not just my opinion. It is clear in the Quran. Um, I have, uh, we have another one here, just to manage our time more, um, uh, from Haley Munoz. And if you want to clarify, uh, feel free. Uh, you said, uh, I'm interested to know your view and the view of our local Islamic community on polygamy. Polygamy? Mm -hmm. Okay. Our view is a view of, uh, uh, of God. Means what? Would it, the, Islam, the Islam came to restrict what was before Islam. Islam came to restrict what is before Islam. Like, before Islam, if you look into the Old Testament or to the New about David and Solomon, you will find David had like, a hundred, uh, like a 300. Solomon has almost 1,000 wife. Then the Islam came and restricted this to four. And he put condition on those four. This is the, the perspective of the religion. But if you are asking about like the perspective of the Muslim community in El Paso, the perspective of the Muslim community, they cannot do anything except obeying the law of the land. Means if I accept to live in the United States, then I have to go by the, the rules not to marry more than one wife. Because in the religion also, they told us to follow the law of the land. So if you were in a country that it was illegal, then that would then that standard would be subjective to basing on the ruling leaders yes. of the nation? Y yes, if someone in okay. Saudi Arabia, for example, he's allowed to marry one, more than one wife, okay? Uh, I, I, I would like for the one who asking the question to just go deep and to research this, because every order from God is for the benefit of the human being. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot more to unpack. On, um, and maybe yeah. we'll have time in the discussion groups um, yeah, to, I, I, um, to I dive into that. To, are you, you're not able to stay, though, are you after? Um, we have a few more questions, though. We'd like to keep you for a couple more minutes if we can. No, 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 no problem. Go ahead. How can God easily forgive us? That, that's more my question. You said it's easy for God to forgive. Why? Why is that easy for him? Especially, you think that would be a higher standard. You have to, again, you have to separate between the rights of God. Rights of God, it's exactly like, I'll tell you, uh, if your uh, child, two years old, came and he stepped on your feet, is it easy for you to forgive him or not, or not easy? That's, that's pretty easy for me to grab him. Yes, because you are an adult. It is, he is your son and you love him. And many reasons, correct? The oh, yeah. All those the, are true. The, the relation with God is the same. Okay. And he doesn't step on my foot because he hates me, though. No, no, no. God, okay. Again, the Constitution is not coming to give you a hard time. Constitution coming to give, to let you give everyone his rights. God has rights on you. This rights, it's easy for him to forgive you as you did forgive your child because he is your ch child, okay? It is very easy for him. But when it comes to my rights, you steal money from me, then I have this rights to forgive you or not to forgive you. And God has to give me my rights back. If you didn't settle with me, if you didn't settle with me, then you are guilty and most likely you will pay punishment. Okay? Um. Therefore, Therefore, like what happened? If you die without settling with me, you are guilty. And you expose yourself to be punished. Unless really you try your hard work to settle with me and you didn't settle because, for example, I am a bad person. I said, no, I don't like to settle with you. In this case, in the day of judgment, God has to settle with me in your behalf if you are a good man. But if you are not a good man, God will not settle with me. God will apply the law. Therefore, there is 
to action. Dealing with you with justice means one plus one equals two. You steal my money, you have to pay. If you didn't pay in this life, you pay in his hereafter. Okay? This is the justice. And there is mercy. Mercy for those who really try hard. I'll, I, I see your hand. I will I'll take your question. Those who really try hard in this life to do good and to settle their mistakes and to correct their mistakes, but for some reason they didn't, they were, they were sincere, but they couldn't get it. And in this case, God will have mercy on them by trying to settle with those who they wrong them in the day of judgment. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll go to Justin and then the Morgans next. Uh, so I'm just got to keep moving forward. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Ibrahim. Okay. I just so want to thank, thank you first for coming on and being so gracious and just sharing your uh, sharing with us and stuff. I just want to clarify. I just want to ask you to clarify something and then ask a question. I just want to clarify Tim's point. Um, I think what Tim was getting at is this. Um, imagine you have someone who breaks the law, right? against yes. the lawgivers. So let's imagine that somebody, uh, let's imagine somebody um, robs a bank at gunpoint. Okay, you with me? And imagine they have their day in court and they stand before the judge and they've broken the law. They've robbed a bank at gunpoint and threatened the lady. And imagine stand before the American court and the judge looks down and says, what do you have to say for yourself? You've broken this law. And imagine the criminal says, I'm sorry. You know what? I've done a lot more good things than bad. This is the first bad thing I've done. For most of my life, I've been good, and they outweigh this bad moment. And I'm sorry. And imagine that man is the judge's son. And imagine the judge looks down and says, you know what? This guy's actually my, my uh, blood son, by blood. And uh, he's a pretty good kid, so I'm just going to let him go. So I know he's a bank robber and everything, but he's free to go. And the murderer after him, he's also my son. And he's going to break the law, and I'm going to let him go too. If I were to ask everybody on this panel what they thought about that judge, everybody would say that judge is corrupt, and that is the opposite of justice. So I just make that point, that it seems that um, the system of justice set up would make um, the God of the Quran corrupt. And I'll ask you one real quick question. I'll let you re reply to this. It seems like uh, in Surah chapter 3, verse 3, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, because I'm real, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that in uh, Surah 3, verse 3, um, that uh, Muhammad gave the law of Moses and the gospel of Jesus to mankind um, and that it was truth and that it was a guide for them. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And so if the gospel is true, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So if, if the gospel is true, as Muhammad says, then Jesus is the only way. And I would just urge you to put your faith in him. <laughs> I agree with the statement of Jesus, but I don't agree with your Amen. view. Amen. I don't agree with your view. You have to understand. And let me, let me explain for you. Looks like I will not like... <laughs> it will talk. Can, I, can I just add one more thing real quick? Before okay. You go? okay. Surah, go ahead. Yeah, Surah, just before you go, Surah chapter 6, verse 115 says, The word of thy Lord find its fulfillment in truth and in justice. None can change his words. For he is the one who heareth and knoweth all. So yes. Muhammad in Surah 6 says his words don't change. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Okay. I, I, like the, the, the statement of Jesus is a beautiful statement and it, it is correct. When Jesus came to the Jewish and said, I am the way. Is this very clear for everyone? Did everyone listen? Okay. Let's go a little bit back. Jesus, he came to the Jewish. Is this correct? He went to the Jewish and he said this statement. Is this correct? Did he, did he you're asking, did he, did he just come? Jesus, he went to the, leader, to the leader of the Jewish and he said, I am the way. Is this correct? Well, he preached the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles both. Yes, yes. But right, like, I think you're referring to John correct? 14, 6, right? Is this correct, what I'm saying or not? He went to the Jewish and he told them, I am the way, you have to follow me. Correct? That he said that he was only speaking to Jewish people? <laughs> I, would say, 
I would say that's incorrect, that he's only speaking to the Jews when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Because he, spoke to, he, he, spoke the, the, he spoke to everyone, and he said, I am the way, you have to follow me. Is this correct? Yeah, not just the Jews, but the world, because he tells yeah. his disciples to go but, throughout the whole world preaching that. But, but what, is, what is important for me, the Jewish here, in order to make a point, did he went to the Jewish or he didn't? He, I, I, I'd say he I, went to... Just a while, we'll let, let him finish his point and then we'll um, Wait, kind of he respond. Was asking me a question. He was asking me a question. He was asking... Yeah, this is, this oh, is okay, go ahead. Did okay, he I went to... me a question. I would say he went, he, he, he went for both. Yeah, to the yeah, world. Yeah, but he went to the Jewish, correct? No, I would say he came to the world. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The world it's, would be the world. Uh, this is okay, but it's not my question. My question, he went to the Jewish, correct? Yeah, and everyone, and okay. the world, and the Gentile. Then, then hold on. He went to the Jewish and just try to imagine the situation. He went to the Jewish and he, the Jewish has book already. Correct? Did the, did the Jews have the Torah? Yes. Okay. Then he went to the Jewish and the Jewish has book and he said, you, you have to follow me because I am the way. And this is correct statement. But the question is, who was the way before Jesus? Or the human being were lost and they were in destruction? The gospel laid out in Genesis 3.3. 3. Jesus has always been in the way. He's always been the way. People were saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the Messiah and his work on the cross. In the if, Old if, if, if your statement is correct, why, why is the Jewish reject Jesus? If your statement is correct, not, why, all, the, why not, Jesus, all, not all the Jews rejected Jesus. What, what, why Jesus said, why Jesus said uh, to the Jewish, you have to follow me if he were already exist. Why is Jesus said, I'm not coming to destroy the law of Moses? Well, yeah, as a Christian, we would understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. And also, um, as the Quran states in Levit, um, that the, uh, the God's law never changes. And in the Old Testament, Leviticus 17.11 um, also talks about um, a demand for an atonement, a payment for sin, which is the just payment. Um, so the Old Testament is consistent with the New Testament is what, as Christians, we would believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of perfectly obeying God's law and also the fulfillment of God's demands for justice. But I'll, I'll I think I'll let Justin respond in his presentation as well um, because we need to move I'm, forward. Um, maybe I'm, Eric and Carla Morgan, can you guys go ahead and ask your questions? Um, no. and, and, why, and why the people of the ark were saved? Sorry? And why the people in the ark were saved? Like those who listened to the, the prophet Noah, they were saved. Therefore, the bottom line, the messenger of his time with a new law, he has to be followed. This is the reason Jesus, when he came after Moses, he went to the Jewish and he told them, you know I am the way, you know you have to follow my way. Why? Because they know very well Moses, he informs them about someone coming after him and they should listen to him. And after Jesus, there is another one coming, and this is Muhammad, and they, they have to listen to him. You see what I'm saying? Like, here is the point. If there is a true message from the Creator, and you put it in your back, you trash it, you will be asked by the Creator in the Day of Judgment, why you didn't accept my message? Period. You see what I'm saying? Therefore, as I said for you, it, 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 it was very clear for me. Abraham was here on the right path. When he left, that sent Moses was on the right path. When he left, we, the human being, went astray again. Jesus came to correct us. When he left, we went again to group and sect, to Catholic, to Christian, to Protestant, you name it. Therefore, he sent another one to correct us again. This is a point. That, yeah, uh, Justin, try to uh, make. Okay. Okay. Thanks for clarifying your views, Ibrahim. I'm gonna one more question, um, Eric and Carla Morgan, and we'll kind of keep things moving forward here. Okay. Go ahead, Eric. It's, it's actually with Carla's question here. So. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, 
So going back to the garden and um, we saw that God banished Adam and Eve from um, paradise because they disobeyed him and they sinned. And, you know, we remember that in order to cover their shame, um, they tried to do it with fig leaves. And this is, this is in the Quran and, and also in the Torah. Um, and, and God said, you know, that's not sufficient. You know, the only way to cover your shame is to kill an animal and he clothed them with animal skins. And, um, and so, you know, the Torah and the Injil say that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And, and we know that the Jews sacrificed animals year after year in order to, to cover the sins of, of the people. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we see that even with, with, um, Abraham, when he was faithful to offer his son on the altar, um, God, the Quran says, we ransomed him with a momentous ransom, and God provided a ram in the place of his son. Um, and so we, we see throughout the scriptures that God used the shedding of blood to forgive sins, and um, and that is why in the Injil, it speaks of Jesus as, as the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world, um, of him needing to come to forgive us of our sins, to wipe us clean. And, and, and that is why there's that sacrifice. Um, you know, even in Surah chapter 3, um, it says, Allah mutawafika Isa. And... I know that you might have a different interpretation of mutawafik, but to me that means sacrifice. And um, I know the English versions of the Quran don't say that. But and the, the Arabic ver the Arabic word mutawafik it does not ha it does not have this meaning at all. I'm sorry, yeah. I, I, I know yeah. Arabic very well. Cause to die, because in other places in the Quran, um, mutawafik means to cause to die, and and what I'm wondering is, in one place, when I read in the Quran, it says um, about Jesus, I will cause you to die and raise you up to myself. And then in other places, it says he never died, but he was just brought up. And so, um, wondering about that, um, you know, one place it says one thing, one another. Also, I noticed that in one place, it you know, where Surah 3.3, where it talks about, you know, the, the Torah and the Injil are God's words, but in other places it says, you know, don't receive help from a Christian or a Jew or you will become like them. And, and, and if the Jews and the Christians, or, or the Christians are following the Torah and the Injil, I mean, what is wrong with that? And I don't know, I just find differences in the prophets um I, I don't find differences in the prophets in the Injil and the torah but but then when i read things in the quran i find contradictions between what the Injil says and so i have difficulty with those things uh, you have to find like a uh, difference between uh, what is in the quran and what is in the Injil, because uh, we yeah. have there are differences in what the, because yeah. I know you don't believe that Jesus is God's son. You don't believe he created the heavens and the earth, but the Injil says that he does. He did create the heavens and the earth. And so if Jesus was a creator at the beginning, then he, he was with us all the way. Okay. Again, like look into the, like old testimony and uh, like ask yourself why the people in the ark they were saved because they it says that noah was a preacher of righteousness and he was yeah. the only righteous one yeah, of all the people and so i know in the quran story he had four sons not three whereas in the in or the torah he had three sons but in the quran it's a very interesting story because one son said he wasn't going to get in the ark. He said he was going to climb the highest mountain to be saved. Um, and God sent the flood. Everyone who got in the ark was saved. 
that the other one that climbed the highest mountain was not saved. And for me, that shows that when we try to get to God on our own measures and save ourselves, it's not adequate. We have to use the measures of salvation that God provides. And in that situation, God provided the ark to save Noah and his family. And, and the answer is a question. Why is the people who were saved in the ark? Because they were doing righteous and they listened to God. No Be obey God. Be and Be beautiful, beautiful. That's it. This is what I need from you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Then those who do good and obey God, they were safe. They don't need sacrifice. Well, they but they continued with the sacrifices once Moses you, brought the law. You, you just answer you just answer yourself. I, I am late right now, 20 minutes. Okay, okay well, thanks for your time, Abraham. Um, thanks for sharing and dialoguing with us. We hope you have a great rest of the day. I, I wish I wish I didn't offend anyone. No, no, no. hey, you know, we uh, we enjoy the I'm dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. And I'm sorry for the tide of the time. I'm sorry. Uh, you're good. Well, uh, I'll have to continue some conversations in the future. You have a great day. For sure. You have my email and you can email me to arrange anything you'd like. Okay. Very good. Yeah, we'll do that. Let's make it happen. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. All right. Well, sorry, we got a little off track. Um, I got a kicked out earlier, so I'm glad everyone else stayed on Zoom. I don't know what my computer was doing. Um, so we're going to go with our last uh, presentation, Justin Kleiss from Gospel West Ministries. And so um, he's going to share with us. And after that, we'll go into our breakout groups. Awesome. Uh, originally, I thought it was 20 minutes, so it might be, it might be shorter. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, if you guys don't mind, because I put some information on slides. So I'm going to share my screen. You guys just let me know. If, um, give me a second here. Let me see if I can find it. Can you guys... Can you guys see that? Yeah, we got it. You guys can see it? Okay, let's see if I can press next. Okay. Um, so the questions were, what makes the Bible unique? And what makes, uh, for us, what makes Jesus Christ unique? So what makes our scriptures unique? And what makes Jesus Christ unique? Um, obviously, what makes the Bible unique? We could go hours, even days on this topic, but I'm going to condense it down. Um, and we could always talk more in the breakout sessions if somebody wants to talk about it. But what makes the Bible unique? Let me move this to the side because it's blocking. Um, so when we look at the Bible, the Bible is a collection of 66 books uh, written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different authors. Um, the authors come from a bunch of different trades. They were businessmen, uh, shepherds, traders, fishermen, soldiers, doctors, preachers, and even kings. Um, most of whom were strangers to one another living in different times of history. Yet the amazing thing is that when these 66 books are brought together, they tell one flowing story of redemption, one message, one voice. There's, there's this message that flows from the first book to the last, like a perfect symphony. It's almost like um, 66 different piano keys played over 1400 years and yet it plays the song. This message of, of a savior coming starting in Genesis 3. Um, what makes our scriptures unique the bible and we'll focus on the new testament um one of the questions historians ask when looking at any ancient work um is can we faithfully reconstruct the original text the autographer right um the autograph and for this historians look to manuscript evidence because the more manuscript evidence we have the more likely we are to reconstruct the original um, and the more likely we are to know the accuracy of what was written down um during the time of uh the person who was it was written about and the amount of manuscript evidence for the New Testament dwarfs that of any other ancient work of antiquity. Most ancient books um, from antiquity that we accept as historical have fewer than 10 existing manuscripts. Um, and the New Testament has over 5,800 manuscripts in the original Greek. And if we were to include other language, that number jumps beyond 25,000. Um, historians also look at something. Uh, they look at the date between the original composition and the first manuscript copies that that we have when looking at an ancient uh, looking at ancient literature most ancient works have a gap between around 700 years um, with the work of plato and aristotle uh, considered historical uh, by most people and read on college campuses today they have a gap around 1200 years from the time that they were actually written the original 
and the first manuscript copy that we have. However, in contrast, the New Testament has manuscript evidence to the Gospel of John uh, within 40 years of the original composition. And that would be the John Rylands Papyrus. Um, in addition, we have a near complete copy of the entire New Testament within 100 to 150 years of the original, making the New Testament stand above uh, all other ancient documents uh, today. Um, there's also something that's interesting to understand, and we could go further in this, but um, there seems to be an early Christian creed that's found in one of the letters written to the Corinthians by Paul um, that most New Testament scholars date between 35 and 40 CE. There was this creed that was going around that he would have learned when he was in Jerusalem after his conversion. And we wouldn't doubt that Paul's, no serious historian would doubt that Paul was a historical figure. Um, and we know that he was in Jerusalem after his conversion, where he would have picked up this creed. Um, so this creed's dated, historians would say, uh, New Testament scholars would say just two to seven years after the resurrection. Um, and here it is, for I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he has appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. So we see that we have the early believers um, within a couple years after his uh, death and resurrection um, already confirming this, um, which is pretty remarkable and pretty amazing when we look at um, the New Testament. Um, from a textual point of view, the New Testament is accurate and reliable and stands above the works of Plato, Aristotle, Herodotus, Sophocles, Tacitus, as well as Homer's history of the Trojan War and Caesar's firsthand account of the Gaelic Wars. The manuscript evidence as far as the dating um, dwarfs all these uh, books of antiquity by far. Um, not to mention the fact that you can see that we can completely reconstruct the entire New Testament, uh, minus 11 verses from just the quotes of the early church fathers. We can put what was said back together completely there as well, um, which is amazing. Uh, so with all the manuscript evidence, we can faithfully reconstructs the original firsthand eyewitness testimony that was written down in the New Testament. Um, and that's what uh, makes our scripture unique, that what makes the Bible unique above all other books. Um, we also look at the internal evidence of the Bible, that we have this manuscript evidence, but also the internal evidence that um, these early followers of Jesus took it seriously and wrote down careful accounts. Second Peter 1.16 says, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Uh, John 1.1 1, 1 says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, this is what we're proclaiming to you. Book of Luke chapter 1, verse 1 through 3 says, Many have undertaken to drop an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those were first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. But this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I decided to write an orderly account for you as well. So we see that the manuscript evidence overwhelming. The date between the first manuscript we have and the uh, original dwarfs out of any other book. Um, and we see that the internal evidence, uh, one of the internal evidence is, is that they took this very seriously and were eyewitnesses to the event. Um, we're going to, we'll come back to something, but what I, what I want to focus on is the second thing is what makes Jesus unique and what makes Jesus unique is number one, that Jesus claimed to be God, that the person, um, that Jesus claims to be God. And this sets him apart above all others. Not only that number two, but that he validated it by rising himself from the grave. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next one. I want to take a look real quick at uh, Mark chapter 14, verses 60 through 64. And we're going to look at the first point um, that Jesus um, claimed to be God. So I'll read it. He sent Jesus right here, sending before uh, Caiaphas and the Jewish council, and they're questioning him. Um, and he knows that um, they're questioning him to try and catch him and because they're accusing him of blasphemy. So in Mark chapter 14, verse 60 through 64, um, it goes like this. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? In other books it says, And the high priest put him under oath, 
and said, who are you? Are you the Christ, the son of the God, the son of, son of God, the son of the blessed one? And in verse 62, Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And then notice in 63, the high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. So we see here that he mentions that he's God when asked. And you can see the reaction of the high priest tearing their clothes. Blasphemy. What further evidence do we need? Now, I just want to show you something. I want you to notice real quick, and this is important to set apart the uniqueness of Christ. I want you guys to notice um, where it says the son of man there, where he, he uses the title, the son of man, and applies it to himself, almost like he's talking in the third person. And the son of man was the most popular title given to himself. Jesus often said, the son of man has no place to lay his head. He never said, I, he always called himself in third person, the son of man, which is really strange. But often to keep in mind, Jesus quoted the Old Testament, saying that these Old Testament prophecies were fulfillments of himself. And that's what he's doing here. I want you guys, we're going to take a look now at a book in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, written hundreds of years before this. And he's quoting something about himself. I want you to see why, why the high priests and the others there at the council were so offended. Here's Daniel 7, chapter 13, or chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him, the Son of Man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. So they asked Jesus here. They say, we adjure you, right? We put you under oath. Are you the son of God? And he says, I am. And you will see the son of man sitting right in power. What he's saying by calling himself the son of man, he's saying, I am. I'm the one from the book of Daniel to who all nations will, be, will give homage. I'm the one to who all kingdoms will serve. All nations will fall before me and before my feet. All kingdoms will be given to me. And he says that in front of them. And you see the reaction, they tear their clothes. And he was constantly saying that about himself. And when we look at something else, I'm gonna show you guys another thing. John 10, 31 through 33, notice this real quick. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it is not for good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. And we look throughout the scriptures that Jesus claimed to be God. Now, why is this important? Why is it, why is this important? Why does this make him unique? Um, I want to share something with you, um, is that he claimed to be God. And the reason this makes him unique is this. Um, one of the reasons. C.S. Lewis gave his famous, um, his famous writing where he says, uh, Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Uh, many people would say, um, if you ask them on the street, who, G who do you think about, who do you think Jesus was? Many would say, well, Jesus was a good teacher, or I think he was a kind man who gave us good teachings, or I think he was a prophet. But here's, here's the logic that C.S. Lewis gave, and uh, is that this, that any man who walks around claiming that he's God, any man who walks around and says, all nations will be given to me, all, I will, I'm the king of the world, all nations will be given to me. Um, I sit at the right hand of power and you'll see me on the clouds coming in heaven, right? Any man who claims to be God, there's only two logical possibilities that anyone listening to this or anyone on the planet can come to. I would narrow it down to two. Jesus is either, he's either crazy or he is who he says he was. I want you to think about that. Anyone who claims to be God, that claims that all nations should serve him and that he's the king of the world, right? That he's God. Anybody who claims to be God is either crazy or he is who he says he was, right? You can't say, you can't listen to this and say, well, Jesus was a, was a good teacher. Anybody who claims to be God and, and isn't, isn't a good teacher. He's crazy. You can't say he was just a prophet. He never claimed to be a prophet. He claimed to be God in flesh. You have two possibilities. Everyone listening to this has to say Jesus was crazy or he is who he says he was. Um, He's either crazy or he is who he says he was. 
And that's one of the things that makes him unique is that he claimed himself to be God. And before you say he's crazy, one of the things you have to ask yourself is you have to look and see the nations built in his name, all the hospitals, all the orphanages, the world changed, lives transformed. I have family on here. Uh, I know people around the world that lives have been changed. I know drug addicts that are no longer drug addicts, families that have been healed, alcoholics that are no longer. I know people that have been completely transformed and it's amazing. So he's either God, everyone has to decide for themselves. He's either who he says he was or he's crazy and there's nothing else. And the second thing that makes Jesus unique is that he rose himself from the dead, um, that he rose himself from the dead. Um, if we're going to talk about how is Jesus unique among all others, you can visit the grave, grave of Muhammad, then you can visit the grave of Buddha, but you can't visit the grave of Jesus Christ because he's not there, because he's God and he rose himself from the grave, that Jesus is, is alive, um, fully God, fully man. And uh, one last thing I want to leave you guys with would be this. I want to take a look real quick at the minimal facts of the resurrection. So I want to focus in on the resurrection. Um, we want to take, what are, the, what are the base facts that most historians and universities around the world accept? So when we look back at these writings of the New Testament, um, when we look back at what we consider to be historical, right? What, what would skeptics um, what would skeptics accept? And when we look at these, these facts right here, these facts are uh, accepted by critical scholars as well. You guys have heard of Bart Ehrman, uh, a New Testament critic. He's a scholar and a critic, and he's debated many people, but these minimal facts um, are accepted by most. And it's this that we have to explain away, that demand an answer and a verdict. Um, so the following facts are so strongly attested historically that they are granted by nearly every scholar who studies the subject, even the rather skeptical ones. Uh, Bart Ehrman has said that the Jesus mythers who say that Jesus was just a myth are, are so small and not to be taken seriously. Um, professor at uh, University of North Carolina. The first fact, Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. That's accepted as a historical fact. Number two, Jesus' tomb was indeed found empty. Number three, the early followers of Jesus believed that he had been raised from the dead, that they actually uh, that the tomb was empty and they believed that he had been raised from the dead. Um, the fourth historical fact is that the early followers of Jesus spent their lives proclaiming in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas that he had indeed risen from the dead. They believed it um, and they spent their whole lives proclaiming it. And lastly, the early followers of Jesus went to their deaths proclaiming this truth, that we know that they went to their deaths proclaiming this, not denying it. Um, so what we have to do is, uh, we can't start with, when we look at the resurrection, it's, it's evidence that demands a verdict. It's powerful. This is what sets Christianity apart. This is what sets Jesus apart. And to be logically consistent, to not be completely outside of, uh, textual criticism or, uh, in a minute, uh, small academic, you know, side, uh, subset. We have to start here. What happens? Why did they believe this? And why were they willing to go to their death uh, over this? So um, that's the second thing. And the third thing, uh, so what, that's what makes the Bible unique. This is what makes Jesus unique is that he claimed to be God and he rose himself from the dead. And the last thing would just be what, what I want to share with everybody. And what I would want to share with everybody is number one is that everybody here and everybody who watches this later must, ex must come to the conclusion that Jesus was either crazy or he was who he says he was. He was God in the flesh. And Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. And Jesus taught that all men had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That we had all got, uh, we'd all turned our back and rebelled against God. That we have broken his laws daily. That we are born sinners. That a sin nature has been passed down from Adam and Eve to all of us through the act of conception and that we are born dead in our sins, that we are a slave to sin, that we want nothing to do with God, and we are, and, and uh, sin and death has followed us, that all, because we've sinned, all men must die. Um, but Jesus paid, paid the penalty for all people. It was his death for our death, and if you put your faith and trust in Christ, that uh, you be forgiven and be made right 
with God. And one last thing I want to share is this, is that uh, we talked about this last time, is that all world religions, um, you can break them down just into two. Uh, all There's religions that are reaching, trying to work towards God. You listen to Ibrahim, he's trying, he's striving, do better, make, make, uh, make up for what you've done, um, try to live the best that you can. Um, but, and there's other there's another religion where it's God reaching down to man where God saves. And in that category, Christianity stands alone. Um, and it's like this. I just want to help us understand when we look at the cross, when we look at the resurrection, I just helped kind of end with this and help everybody understand for a second. Just uh, imagine for a second that it's 2000 years ago and you're standing uh, on Calvary's Hill and you're standing at the foot of cro- the foot of the cross and no one's there. It's just you. And in your hands, you look down and in your hands is a scroll, and it's black. And what it is, is it's the record of your life. Everything you've done since birth, every thought you've had, is all there in that scroll. And if God looks down upon that, he's angry every day, right? We've sinned every day, every moment, and you hold it in your hands. And a just God must come against sin. And it's not something you want to hold in your hands. And I want you to imagine that in front of you stands Jesus Christ himself. And he stands face to face with you. And in his hands, he also holds a scroll. And in his, that scroll is the record of Jesus's life. From the moment he was born, though, it's different. He's done nothing but make God the Father smile. Every second, every moment, his record is perfect, unlike ours, unlike yours. Now, upon repentance and faith, upon turning away from your sins and trusting in Christ, this is essentially what happens, is that Jesus reaches out and he takes the record of your life upon himself so that when God the Father looks down, he doesn't see Jesus' perfect life, he sees your sinful life. He climbs up on the cross and he pays for it and it's gone. Past, present, future, it's all gone. But it doesn't just end there because Jesus doesn't just take your sinful life out of your hand, your record, and pay the fine for it. But he takes his perfect life that was lived for you and says, here, take it. So then now you look down in your hands and you hold the perfect record of Jesus' sinless life. And for the first time, God the Father looks down from heaven and says, Behold my son, in whom I'm well pleased. And you have a righteous standing before God, not because of works you've done, but because of the perfect life and work of Jesus Christ. That Jesus lived a perfect life, and that's our righteousness, and he's our righteous plea. So it's not by works. As Christians, we're saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. And I would just urge anyone listening here, that looking at the evidence, looking at the facts of the resurrection, that Jesus... Um, offers the hope of redemption, um, the hope of salvation, and um, all those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, Paul says, will be saved. And that's a fact. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. Let me me share my screen real quick. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Let me stop sharing. Did it stop sharing? Yeah, I think so. Okay should be so um well what we'll do about um say 15 we're slightly off schedule but uh that's okay about 15 minutes of 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 q a to the whole group and then we'll uh split into our discussion groups from there um we have raul go ahead and uh i'll unmute you or can unmute yourself yeah yeah um i have several questions but i don't want to uh um, take a lot of time. Uh, basically, it's, it's uh, what um, what would you call Justin? What would you call him a fact versus a uh, saying? I'm sorry, I got a little one running in here. Oh, you're uh, you're muted. Can you close this, man? I'm sorry, I had a little one running in here right now. Uh, looking for her teddy bear. Perfect timing. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, my friend. Could you ask the question again? Yeah. Uh, uh, what would you consider a fact versus a, um, a saying? Some, some, something someone said. What would I consider? What would, what would be truth versus just something somebody said? Like, how do I know uh, what somebody said is true? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, how would I know uh, somebody said is true is if, um, well, f- well, first off, uh, Jesus said that uh, his word is truth. He said, I am the truth and the way and, and the life. No one comes to the Father through me. So Jesus claims to be the truth, 
um, and he claims to be God and that his, his, uh, he claims to be God and he's, and the reason I accept it is because he's proven it by, by raising himself from the dead. But I would ask, a follow, I would ask a follow-up question real quick is that, um, how do you know what's true? My, my following question, uh, uh, Justin would be, um, okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's part of it. I mean, how would you know if he really raised from the dead? But what would happen if someone else does? Would be that God too, or? You're asking what, what would happen if someone else rose from the dead? Yes. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what would happen if someone else rose from the dead. I'm not sure. And, and, and the other question I had is that you, you were saying that, um, I'm sorry, I, I, I just want to ask this second question. Can um, I ask you a question though real quick? Yes. A follow-up is, how do you know what someone says is true? I would try to verify myself with my own experience. And, but regardless of the, the saying of the person, um, what I consider more useful is to, to, to be able to tell if what I've been told is, is, is uh, of benefit to me or is not. So something's only true if it benefits you? No, it's, it could be true. I mean, it could be true if I know that something is not beneficial for me, but I know it's not, then it's, it's probably true and it's, it's, it's not good for me. So I would probably avoid that thing that it's not good to me. Let me ask you a question. Is what, is what you just said true? What I would say is true. It's true for my experience, yes. How do you know it's true? Because it's 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 being proved that it's been working for me so far. I, I cannot say I cannot say that it's I'm gonna be the same for everyone else, but that's that's what Buddha taught us to do. It's it's just put it put it at test, see if it works for you, if it works for your own experience, and if it works for you and you're not harming anyone else, then that's a valid um uh that's a valid way of doing things. It's, it's, okay. You're not hurting yourself. You're not hurting any, anybody else. You're promoting love and compassion and, and, and well-being for everyone, everyone else by you, what you were, you're doing. Then it's probably good. So if, if someone, so if truth is, if someone says something that doesn't hurt anybody and that works for people, then what, do you think what Jesus said hurts anybody? No. I'm just trying to to um, true by to, your standard of truth. It, you, 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 you would probably uh, agree on that that the Christian faith has a lot of um, uh, dogma, dogmatic faith, right? It's it's there are many things that cannot be proven, but that they're taken as as the true because you believe on them. And and like that's why I was asking you why why what would you consider a, a fact and what would you consider a, a saying because hey. everything you're you, you're listed in the minimal facts of the resurrection it's testimonials basically and and not really scientific facts per se. Hey, if I could expand on some of your question to Justin, um, I think philosophically speaking. We have the, uh, the concept of knowledge itself. We'd call it true justified belief. And so we'd say something is true if it corresponds to reality. Justified meaning you have a rational position holding to that, um, rational reasons for holding to that position. And belief, uh, typically people categorize it as um, non-thinking or non-intellectual. Um, I don't think that's the biblical definition of faith though. It's based off a good reason. And you see that in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. In Second Peter one sixteen, so biblical faith would be active trust based off of what you have good evidence for. Um, unfortunately, at the time constraints, there's only so much Justin can unpack on this. Uh, can I just do one last thing, Caleb. Yeah, go ahead. Is that uh, I just like to ask you a question? You said that the minimal facts, of the resurrection, are not scientific facts. They're not scientific facts. They're historical facts. So I get asked. Right? I get, I guess you can't it's, repeat the resurrection because the I scientific ask, is observable and reputable. I would ask you this question. Um, I would say that, um, do you believe that, do you believe uh, that Plato, uh, that Plato existed or Aristotle? 
Would you accept that as a historical fact? I, with some reserve, yes. <laughs> okay, can you give me the scientific evidence for that? No. Okay, of course. So I can't give you the scientific evidence. We, we use historical evidence. So that's what that is. I, 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 the, the difference is that I, I would take that as a reference only, not as a, as a, as a fact or a, a, a hard belief on something that I cannot prove unless I put it on into practice. Can you give me the scientific evidence that Buddha existed? The historic Buddha, yes. The, the, the person existed. It doesn't, there's no record uh, or scientific investigation about many, many supernatural things that are um, um, uh, related to the Bud what Buddha did because it, there's so many uh, stories about uh, miracles made by the Buddha uh, or performed by the Buddha. But the thing is that those are not really key for accepting Buddha's teachings because he was not teaching us that he was supernatural or he had supernatural powers, but he was teaching us to uh, change our minds. And like I said, minds is not intellectual thing, but a, a heart between heart and intellectual. And, and that was, I mean, everything he did or he was supposed to do back then, uh, any supernatural power that are, are, are supposed to be um, attributed to, to him, they're not really key for understanding his teachings. He, that doesn't really matter for many Buddhists. It's like, okay, that's some story, some, some um, uh, things people said, but that's not the core of the teachings. Um, well, because of time, I want to give some other people some opportunity to share some of their thoughts. I uh, appreciate you, you. Raul, you. explaining Thank your you. position. Um, Thank you. There was a comment here. I just want to address in the in the chat here, and then I think the Morgans had one. Um, someone mentioned they felt um, listening to arguments over semantics of ancient mythology and creation stories seems counterproductive and divisive for further progress of the human race. I'm curious to know if the presenter's motivation for sharing and promoting your beliefs is for affirmation personally or for your life church choices or a concern for salvation of others or, of course, some other reason. Um, so I'll allow you, Justin, to answer that. Um, but I want to say real quick that I think I fully expect, for example, Abraham to uh, represent the Islamic viewpoint um, that he would hold convictions. And that doesn't offend me that he holds convictions. Um, so um, as, as the host itself, I expect everybody to have their positions to be willing to persuade others to that. Um, I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. Um, I expect the methodological naturalist or atheist or position or Buddhist position that you guys would um, w be willing to persuade others to that. So I don't have a problem of anyone um, on that case. Obviously, I don't think as a Christian, there is neutrality on worldviews. Somebody is taking a position on their worldview. So I, again, that's, that's what we should expect. Um, and if someone doesn't have convictions, I think they may be trying to water down their understanding of truth itself. Um, to say that uh, contradictory ideas can be true. So I think it leads into Justin's point, either Jesus rose from the dead or not, either we have early testimony, uh, extra biblical testimony, um, eyewitness testimony, or we don't. So uh, all of world history and understanding of the nature of humanity and the problem of solution rises or falls on questions such as these. So um, I don't know, Justin, if you wanna to respond to that as well. No, definitely. Hi, Haley. It's good to meet you. I, I, I never met you. I didn't know. I, uh, God bless you for putting up with Brian, man. You're, you're tough. <laughs> uh, so you said as an outsider and atheist listening to arguments over semantics uh, of ancient mythology and creation stories seems counterproductive and devices for the future, uh, for future progress uh, of, hu of the human race. Um, so I, I would just say that I don't believe they're semantics uh, at all. I think that it's evidence that demands a verdict. Oh, let me go. I just lost my screen. Wait, hold on. Ah, can you guys see me? Oh, okay. Uh, so when we look at the minimal, when we look at the minimal facts of the resurrection, I don't think there's semantics. Um, I think they're historical attested facts that demand an answer. So if if you could, um, how do you if you could how would you explain away these minimal facts? I'm just curious that 
um, even Bart Ehrman would accept these in most uh, New Testament critics and skeptics um, and agnostics uh, would say that Jesus was crucified, Jesus' tomb was found empty. The early followers of Jesus believed that he had been raised from the dead, that they spent their lives proclaiming in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas that he had risen from the dead, and that the early followers of Jesus went to their deaths proclaiming this truth. I'd just be interested in you explaining those semantics away. Oh, that actually wasn't my question. Mm. Oh, sorry, I thought it was a question. Um, no. well, I appreciate you sharing, though. Um, so I, think I, was, I was just questioning why you personally feel compelled to do this. It's at the bottom of oh, the paragraph. Okay, the second part of the question? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was just looking at the first part of the question where you said the progress of the human race. But, um, yeah, the reason that I, that I share it um, is that I, I really do, I, I think that I, I, I do care for the salvation of others and that I've spent the last 10 years of my life uh, preaching the gospel. I go to parks and, and I uh, gather people and uh, give away uh, groceries and food and, and, um, and just share the gospel with people, give away free Bibles. And I've, I've been doing that for the last nine years of my life. Um, and I'm not paid for it. It's just a conviction I have because I care uh, for the families. And I think that without Christ, there's no hope. And uh, so I do it for that reason. Um, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say that there's not some sinful nature in me as well, um, that uh, that feels that you know there's also a, probably a sinful part in me, of course, that feels like um, affirms uh, when somebody says, "Hey, good job," you know. So I mean, I'm not gonna deny that part. I'm not perfect. I'm not a saint. Um, and I, I would ask if you don't answer, that's fine. But in your question, you said that it seems that what I was saying is. Um, counterproductive to the progress of the human race. And progress seems to suggest that there's some standard of perfection that we're all heading for. This universal standard that I understand, that you understand, that we're moving towards. If we're progressing, we're moving towards something, towards something better, a best. So my question would be, what is this best, the standard that we are progressing towards, that we're far from, and where do you get the standard from? Um, I actually don't have a standard personally. It's just wondering why the arguments, why we will, you know, constantly have to do this to talk about the past. Well, what are we the past that right? did happen or didn't happen or nobody knows what happens. What is the, what is going to be good to come out of this for the future? It seems more like it just divides people. Well, I would say here that you said that it's counterproductive for the progress of the human race. So if we're progressing, um, that means we're moving away from something that's worse towards something that's better. And there must be a standard of better that we're moving towards. So um, you're right to say that you don't, you can't appeal to a standard because we can't appeal to a universal standard like that without a universal lawgiver. So it seems to me that you're borrowing from the Christian worldview just to ask your question and that you know God exists. This shows that uh, you know God exists and that you live in his world, that you're, appeal you're appealing to the That's standard. That's a very, very odd thing to say to someone. I don't appreciate that. Now, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be, uh, not trying to be uh, offensive, but I just think that that's what it shows. And it then, um, I'm sorry about that. But yeah, uh, and I think that the gospel um, does progress us towards a standard and that the preaching of the gospel is, is good for society. That's what I feel. Okay. Uh, Brian, did you have a question? Um, we'll kind of do the last question. Um, I know we were in the chat here. <laughs> um, if not, that's fine. We can kind of discuss more in the discussion time. Okay, you're muted. I don't know if you're talking there. Oh, oops. All right, there you go. Go ahead. Oh, no, I still can't hear you, man, unless it's just me. Does he have his actual mic muted? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, now we can I hear it. That's a mistake I make quite often, actually. <laughs> uh, dismantling presuppositionalist apologetics takes a, a little while, uh, but specifically on the case, since he was going to show a slide on uh, the minimal facts approach, uh, I do find it interesting that he chose five of the normally six standard uh, minimal facts. Uh, but the two items on there that could be talked about in a term of facts, i.e. Jesus existed and that Jesus was crucified. Uh, while they have some historical support, uh, the the most contemporary of which was written six years after the fact, uh, and the language suggested that it was from 
reliable sources. Um, the other three points were basically summed up as, and people believed it and were willing to suffer and die for their belief. Uh, those three are unquestionable. We see today people are willing to die for things that they believe in. Uh, it, it's part of human nature. And so the, 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 the last three of the five are meaningless in my opinion. Yes, they believed. Have I you? Think that's in question. Uh, can I respond to that before you move on, so I don't forget my thought? Go for it. Okay. Well, I think I think you're you're making a, a category there, and I think it's kind of serious. And the fact that, of course, people uh, die for lies today, for what they believe is true, and they die for lies. I wasn't uh, even going to state them as lies, only that right. they believe them. I'm not they, gonna, they believe it's quality. true. There's people who die for lies that believe it's true today. But we're talking about something else. You don't find people. We're talking about the people who are eyewitnesses there, who saw it. So people are dying. People today die for things that they believe to be true, but they don't know they're not true. There are um, two, in the, in the, two authors of the 66 books of the Bible, one that we're fairly certain of. We, uh, historically, we can say, yep, uh, uh, Paul or Saul uh, very likely existed. It's very, very – pretty certain of that and his writings and his letters and his collected works we can say uh, then there is what we think was probably John's doctor uh, was uh, was reporting those works everything else is anonymous and under no circumstances can be believed to be firsthand uh, and Paul even by his own admission was not firsthand and of course John's doctor when he was dying most certainly was firsthand uh, as that was in Greece uh, a decade later uh, so to say that we have these these firsthand accounts to say that we're dealing with something different is it, it just doesn't it, it doesn't even isn't even supported by the own scholarship have you looked into textual criticism by Dr. Daniel Wallace on this issue? Yes, I, I listened to lots of stuff on textual criticisms, and, uh, and, and I love the fact that he brought up the 20 plus thousand manuscripts. Uh, please, you know, discard the 99.9% .9 of them that were done in the, the second and third century afterward. Manuscript just meant handwritten. There's a reason why manuscripts stopped being made as soon as we had the printing press being handwritten after the fact, it just means that you had monasteries full of monks copying it, and that's wonderful. And the earliest works, while indeed they've done an amazing job of piecing stuff together, most of which were smaller than a business card, uh, but the, the work they did to, to piece together those early accounts is most certainly to be lauded. There's, there's a tremendous amount of scholarship there, but in the end, even e – even if you're able to piece together the most accurate and earliest accounts that you can, you still don't get to first person. And every historian in the area, uh, even the, uh, the Testimonium Flaviatum, uh, even if you don't consider the fact that it was a later edition in the fourth century, um, all of them say, and the Christians say that, and these Christians do believe, and it is said that. Uh, we, don't, we don't have actual Roman records uh, of the crucifixion. Uh, Actually, that's not um, accurate. We have, uh, we have uh, people, um, other historians, affirming the major details of Jesus' life. We have uh, Tacitus, and there's... Yes, Tacitus, six years after the fact, uh, stating that it was done uh, mm -hmm. by, the, by the rule of Pontius Pilate, but we don't have any of the actual Roman records. They were fantastic record keepers, but unfortunately, that stuff doesn't really survive. Um, it, we lose most of it. Uh, but which is why I said I'm willing to accept those first two of the of the five facts he sent he, he presented, uh, because sure a guy named Jesus existed. We don't even have to go the the mythicist position. Sure, yeah, he was he was crucified. I, I accept those. That's Brian. Fine. So you you changed your position since the last time I spoke to you because in our last debate, you questioned if Jesus even existed, and you were on the Jesus. Uh, and today, and today I am granting it because I'm specifically you addressing said, your minimal science approach. Guys? No, I, I'm still unconvinced of his existence, um, but much like uh, our... But didn't you just say he existed? I said I am willing to grant that he existed. So you do um, believe he exists? I, you're not very good at listening to English. Okay. I am willing you're saying to it's possible he existed. 
Well, it's certainly or you possible. Said possible. I'm, for the purpose of this dialogue, I'm willing to grant the first two points of the minimal facts approach. And I've been looking for the last 30 minutes to find any other piece of scholarly research, any other attempt at any other event that uses the minimal facts approach. And so far, I've been unsuccessful. Uh, I, I find that approach to be aptly named. Um, it is most certainly minimal in its factualness. Um, and this is why I didn't want to start addressing presuppositionalism because it's very hard to maintain a neutral tone. Well, this is, people who are, don't hold the methodology of presuppositional, um, they will still share minimal facts. But I think the issue you have to grapple with still is even if you grant the Josephus quote of uh, the first one you're talking about that may have had it added a line, even uh, non-believing scholars would say that the 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 core of it mentioning Jesus is there, but there's also another text that um, Josephus quoted, James, the brother of Jesus. Um, you have that issue. Is that quote, most scholars think that, that all of that is original. And so you have, to, you kind of have to sweep away all these other quotes where we're saying yeah, we have- the letters of Paul talking about the brother of Jesus. Um, this well, I'm talking about Josephus and not just Paul, but we also have in the first century, we have um, Irenaeus and other church historians affirming that the four gospels were connected um, with Matthew, um, Mark, who was um, also oh, connected with absolutely, people. they're connected. They're, yes, they're written, but you said that there was no based upon based upon each other. No, what I'm saying is that you know Matthew was not written by Matthew, nor Mark, nor Luke, nor John. The only, see, that's the only a claim books. that you're not supporting, though, because we have solid evidence that those are connected well, I mean, very early. My chance in there, real quick. You you just said that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not written we're by not them. Written. Is, that, is that correct? Yes, that is that is indeed are, what I said, and that, are that you, is that is. Are you certain about that? I hold no absolute certainty on any subject. So you're, you're not so, certain about that. Uh, I believe the Catholic Church said that we're going that was semantics. true. That Brian, what Brian's claim is that, that the Catholic Church says uh, they were not written by those individuals. Well, that's, that's another kind of worms. Church. Yeah, but, are you uh, certain, modern, are you text, certain modern textual criticism holds that that the. That the synoptic gospels are not first hand accounts. Are you certain? Um, that? Well, I would that's also a claim that even Bart Ehrman with his book Bruce Metzger, who was evangelical believer, Bart Ehrman said he would be in nearly agreement with all the New Testament um, manuscripts as far as the variants go. So again, that's a claim without supporting evidence, because our Bart Ehrman is a skeptic and he'd say we do have what they originally wrote. And most. Uh, no, no. What the authors of those books originally wrote, I would, I would be hard pressed to find uh, a quote of Bart Ehrman saying that the apostles themselves wrote those accounts. I, I would be, I, I would love to please forward me, uh, any modern scholar. I have a he, quote from uh, Bart Ehrman right here. If all other sources for all knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, the patristic quotations would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. So that's Ehrman and uh, Bruce Metzger and his text of the New Testament. And so having studied the originals, he would make that claim as well. But he also said in misquoting Jesus at the end, even though we may disagree, referring to his mentor, Bruce Metzger, on important religious questions he is firmly committed christian and i am not we are in complete agreement on a number of very important historical and textual issues if you or i were put in a room and asked to hammer out a consistent statement on what we think the original text of the new testament probably looked like there would be very few points of disagreement maybe one or two dozen places out of many thousand um nothing in there refuted what i said i, I my, my, my my statement is that the the first, the most original texts that we have been able to reconstruct from these various fragments, again, due to the hard work and scholarship of people throughout centuries, none of them say that Mark was bitten by Mark, or Matthew by Matthew, or Luke by Luke, or John by John. Okay, now, but John, you're saying none. I want John's you to name doctor. scholars because I'm studying textual criticism right now, and Indeed. I have access to... And in your quotes, you are not refuting my point. You are saying that they, they would agree on the contents. That's wonderful. Nothing in there says authorship. Nothing in there makes any claim about first-hand accounts, which, which is my point. Authorship, we have a quote in the early century, uh, as I mentioned, by Irenaeus affirming that the other issue is that the original manuscripts can last two to three hundred years as well, because you would have to also be assuming that the fragments we have in the second and third century and complete books um, were completely disconnected from the original manuscripts. 
Um, but in the Oxyrhynchus papyrus in that collection there, and the, we found library discards in the third or fourth century, but they were dated first and second century um, and still in fairly good condition, which shows the original manuscripts can last two to 300 years. And so what we have around P52 and P66 and the Bodmer papyrus, those are all direct witnesses to the manuscripts in the first century. But even on authorship, even if we didn't know those, the issue still stands that we have all the I quotes. Know. You make an interesting leap there. You, you talk about the the, extra, the excellent textual reconstruction, the excellent mm -hmm. research and scholarship done, and then you say, but even if we couldn't do the authorship, and at no point have you has anyone here addressed the authorship. They just say that these are these are the earliest originals. I'm I'm not no I'm not well counting that. the sure. ca the case I'm saying is we can, can know um, we can know with reliable accuracy what the original said but the point i'm even if i was to grant your position I'm not, on i'm if not refuting might. the accuracy i'm not refuting that accuracy i have no access to any more accurate information than anyone else does about the original manuscripts of any of the new testament or old testament or any gospels i i have i have no special access to any knowledge what i'm saying is to the best of scholarly evidence that no one is making claims that any of those accounts, with the exception of Paul, are first-hand accounts of anyone who witnessed these events. Okay. Oh, we have the, the issue, too, is we have the Moratorian Fragment, which dates in the second century, and it also does connect that a gospel was, uh, was recognized as authoritative if it was connected to a first-century eyewitness, and they were connected with one who was directly involved with Jesus' ministry. So I'm not sure if you know about the Moratorian Fragment that also lists um, so, it's so the standard, how we know. That they talked to a guy that saw the guy whose cousin was totally there. Okay, yeah, well, the issue is we still have the originals there. Um, we still yes, have you, the originals. You, you um, have an original from a century later. Excellent. That, that's fantastic. I would, I would just say this. I would, I would just, because we could probably have to move on, but Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the uh, the methodology used to affirm something a writing as historical or a person as historical, um, where you say that uh, our nearest manuscripts that we have are like a hundred or two hundred years out. So if you have any manuscripts, you said uh, two hundred years from the original, throw them out. Um, but if you did that, then um, every ancient work of antiquity you have to throw out as well. So I just wonder actually, if you, actually I never said any of that. You um, did. You said if any. You said all the manuscripts, two hundred and three hundred years out, throw them out. You can record. I said, you I said, your, I said your claim of authorship. Um, and as far as uh, comparative history, um, normally the most uh, reliable sources we take are those of dissenters, those of enemies, those who 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 don't like you. Um, Perfect. If they say the same Perfect. thing about you. Can I jump into that? Perfect, because we see that the Jews in the New Testament, they, the ones who hated the, Christ, the Christians, these Jews that crucified Jesus, they said that they stole the body. They said the body wasn't there. So the enemies attested that the body wasn't there, that the empty tomb wasn't there. So if you take that evidence, and, um, then we can take that you evidence. Know, I've never had a Jew tell me that. that that's very interesting. Um, so, okay, so... Say we grant he existed, okay. say we grant he was crucified, say we grant he was in a tomb that he had his body stolen. How does that in any way like, lend veracity to any, to any of, the, of the wonderful claims? Uh, because if they stole his body, that doesn't sound much like he raised himself from the dead. That sounds like a, a direct refutation of your claim. It would no. be very difficult for Christianity to even arise if all you have to do is bring the body out for one. And people will die for what they think to be true, but no one dies for a lie. But we're going to have to move forward. Uh, Roll last question, and then we'll go to a, a short discussion break. So maybe you, can, you guys can expand on these in groups if you would like. Go ahead, Roll. Yeah, I, I was just, um, maybe, maybe this was for the break, but um, this is supposed to be a dialogue, not a, a I think it's not a, a debate. It, and, which is why and, I didn't want to address presuppositionalism. Because yeah. It, de it degenerates <laughs> into that very quickly. All right. Yeah, and, and, and it, it's it, the reason I was questioning uh, Justin about the minimal facts, it, it was because um, I, I, 
like like I was saying, Buddhism is not relying on on the the miracles and the uh, supernatural uh, things that are um, uh, said about the Buddha. That's not really important, and that's not the reason why we believe. If, if we can say we believe, we I, I should say we trust his teachings most more more than believe that his teachings because he was he he actually said do not believe in my teaching just just prove them uh, or try them and um and i think uh, and and just just uh repeating what i i i sent by uh on, on, in the chat um actually buddhism accepts every tradition i mean spiritual tradition as valid and and it it says uh, buddhism is not the only way definitely is it, it we don't have the truth the absolute truth we just have a way to find the, the what we could we can we would consider the truth but we are our goal is to be liberated of suffering and and say if i mean every uh, spiritual tradition has its own uh, methodology to find the truth or what they consider the truth or well-being or or whatever you want to call it and it's it's valid and and it's it's i mean buddhism is not for everyone christianity christian uh christianity is not for everyone uh islam is not but so it's it's like every flavor for every taste and that's valid and, and as long as we can we can be together and and we can uh have a dialogue that's 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 really good we can, can, I address, can, I address we can and, and 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 also just just one last thing justin um we uh just follow, uh, also following up uh Haley's uh comment i'm not here to promote buddhism but to share buddhism and and we're we're probably one of the the the, the, the tradition the spiritual traditions that are not trying to get to get the uh, followers we're not we're just not trying to do so it's it's like if if you want to come and see what's in it then you're more than welcome but we're not going to try to keep you here and and many people comes and goes we, we our center has 30 plus years in the city in el paso and it's still very small and we're fine with it it's it's fine it's fine so it, i i just wanted to, to okay. say that let me, let me respond to a couple things just real quick. The first thing I would say is that, I'll go backwards. Uh, well, first, the first thing I would say is that you said um, that you believe that, that all religions are valid. You, just, that you said that you just said that all religions are valid and that that's what Buddhism says, um, that all religions are valid. As long as they pursue the, the well-being. Okay, all, all, re all religions are, are valid. And you say that, so Buddhism says there's many ways and that all religions are valid. But Jesus says there's one way. He said, I'm the truth, the way, and the life. No one comes to the Father by me. Buddhism says there's many ways. That's a contradiction, law of non-contradiction. Not all religions are valid, first of all. And then the second reason is that um, it's a dialogue, uh, true. And I try and I try, if I haven't been respectful with what I say or angry, or if I've shouted at anybody, I apologize because I'm supposed to be uh, give the truth with gentleness and respect, but as a Christian, um, my scriptures say that I'm supposed to preach the gospel to every creature, and always be giving, be willing to give an apology, a defense for the hope that lies within me, and that my hope and my burden is for the lost. And my religion, your your religion, may not say to reach out, but mine does. Mine says to care for the orphan, the widow, to preach the gospel to every creature. So I do it, and if that offends people. Um, I'm the, sorry. The, I, gotta, the, I gotta go with my with my conviction. Yeah. The, pro the, the problem I see uh, about someone someone telling me that I'm lost is that uh, I'm I'm lost uh, based on what? I, I, I mean, not because we don't share the same path. It's it, it means that we're lost. We we have different paths maybe to get to the same goal, and maybe we we're more similar than we think. And I actually believe that we're, we're every every major faith in the world shares more than what uh, it's it's different among them. I, I think we share the same values. We share love, compassion, uh, respect for life, 
many, many things that we share and, and the methods and the, the philosophy and, and the beliefs, those are like not really that important as long as we're, we're, we're looking for the well-being of every, everybody. And we're looking for for love and, and compassion. Hey, um, sorry, real quick. Um, so in the chat, we were just talking about. I think uh, we'll just stay in here unless anyone objects um, for our discussion. I'd like to hear from some others who haven't um, chimed in yet. Um, if if you guys uh, have any other comments, so we can uh, probably go ten or fifteen um, or so. And I know some who had to leave. That's fine. Um, but. Uh, yeah, thanks for your comments, Roel. I don't know if you needed to finish out on anything else there. No, just okay. just 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 stress that. Um, yeah, we we respect. I mean, it, there's a difference of, uh, about respecting and and and, and giving freedom. I think it, it, some uh, some people might say I respect your religions or your your beliefs, but I don't I don't share them, and that's fine. But I don't consider that they're unvalid because I don't share them. So that's that's what I, I I think that that makes a difference, a big difference. And I think I, I I'm sorry I you don't you don't show your your first name, uh, Mr. Chavez. You were trying to say something. Yeah, I was I was gonna agree with you. Um, I used to be a Catholic, and uh, right now I'm I'm on uh, I'm reading uh, this book right now. If you can see it, the Book of Mormon, and uh, w what it comes down to. When I when I saw um, uh, Justin's uh, PowerPoint um, as a, as a school teacher and a scientist, because you know, we have to meet uh, and talk about the kids and talk about raw data, um, you asserted a lot of claims on there, and one of them that I was kind of offended by, you said it about Plato, was you know uh, it was a twelve hundred year um, differential between his writings and when he might have been alive, but he didn't make any claims I mean, the only claim he really made was you can either take the choice of being good or take the choice of being bad uh just take a look at his, the one that uh, my kids looked at as eighth grader we were reading the, the republic and that's uh, the story about a king who found a ring and he had a choice to do something good with it or do something bad well he chose to do something bad because in reality if you got away with no consequences you do something bad and so what that leads to is that they're, they taught life's lessons. And they didn't, uh, and as a former Catholic, former Christian, it was always, I was the bad one. And I'm not. I don't believe in slavery. The Bible says it. Hey, you can do it. I don't believe in rape. The Bible says, hey, you can do it. Uh, and the book falls apart from Chapter one, I mean, you look out in the universe, I have a picture of the world behind, or the planets behind me, and, you know, there's galaxies, and they're made a certain way. They just what you know, uh, in seven days, here they were made, because we can see this laboratory behind us. Um, so, I mean, it's, uh, your PowerPoint was great if you were going to make a point, at, you know, for Jesus' existence through the Bible, but I didn't see any referencing outside the bible that would convince me or any muslim or any buddhist or uh, and i used to believe that stuff I, I i don't uh because i've searched for jesus trust me and i didn't find him uh, all i found was a bunch of stories and you know uh people that came back alive you know there's uh bruce lee was supposed to come back alive there's writings there's there's witnesses i don't see no bruce lee they say the same thing about elvis i don't i mean i'm still shaking it i'm still doing rock and roll but I don't see no Elvis. I mean, I see Elvis impersonators. You know, can I, can I answer that. Go, go for it. I want to convince me, and give me some references. Don't just say the Bible says so, because you know I, I have thirteen quotes from extra biblical no, sources. Spider Man comment. Let, let me share. Let me let me answer because I have to leave at four thirty, and I'd love to answer what you said. Um, you said that you're reading stuff, and you you were figuring out what's bad, right? You were you're talking about things being bad. So I just like to. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't say that. I said I was. Your example of Plato was a bad example because uh, Plato didn't. I mean, he didn't make huge claims that somebody came back alive from the dead. He's just saying you, you have a choice of being good or bad. Period. Well, you would, you would hint to that. 
to some things that gods in the Old Testament were bad, correct? Yeah, yeah, slavery. Yeah, maybe, let's go with that. That may be even evil, right? So yeah. let me just say something, okay? That when you pre presuppose something is evil in your statement right now, you're also presupposing something is good, aren't you? When you say that something's evil, you're presupposing that there's something is good. And when you presuppose something that's good, as if you, when you presuppose something is that's evil, and you presuppose something is good, you're also presupposing a standard that I understand, and everybody in this room understands what you're talking about. When you say this is evil, there's some standard that we all have to look at and be like, "You're right." So when you presuppose evil, you presuppose good. When you presuppose good and evil, you presuppose a universal standard. And when so you so you're presuppose presupposing that slavery is good. Then. Hold, on, hold on. When you presuppose a universal standard. Uh, you're presupposing a universal lawgiver. So in your question to discredit God, you've proved his, his existence. So what's your question? Uh, no, I didn't approve of God. I didn't say there was no God. I'm saying if that's his word, that's his word. That's what that's on your shoulders, man, because he was for slavery. If you find him as a just God, if he can look down and say, don't eat shrimp, ah, slavery is okay. Can we make a that's category? Okay, bro? that's that's a broad a statement. Taking, there? Yeah, taking scriptures out of context and their cultural I'm not, as well. Do not eat shrimp in nine different spots. You're assuming slavery that's is nine? Slavery. No, that's not. So Carla here has a couple things about the slavery noted in the Old and New Testament. So I'll just let. You... Uh, when you look at slavery in the Old Testament, it's very different from the slavery that we perceive with our history in our country. Um, in the Old Testament, people sold themselves as slaves because they couldn't pay their debts. And it was a volitional thing. It, it wasn't something where someone goes to another country and steals people and, and makes them slaves. It was something they did themselves. Uh, uh, Leviticus 25 says you can get slaves from around uh, the nations around you. That's right. what America and did. Those slaves, those slaves, well... Maybe because of war, I'll give you no, that. No, no. There are, okay, there if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, the writings of the Southern uh, churches, they said, we are following scripture. We are buying our slaves, not from our lands, but from the lands around us. We are, they were missing we are beating them, but not killing them, but there was no accountability for that. They're using it for it. Okay. But there's also the assuming that people are made in the image of God and have inherent dignity, um, which comes from the Christian worldview. Because where do you give and get human? Okay, now that's, now that's cherry picking a very small part as opposed to Leviticus. You cherry pick too. The entire so. chapter. No, well, see, that's the thing. We understand it contextually as well is part of the issue. 150 years ago, my brother, we would be agreeing that you would say, yes, God says it's fine to own people wait, like me. Wait, let me, let me interject real quick with some, with some facts that you have William Wilberforce who used the scriptures um, to go against slavery so, so that when we came against the abolition of slavery, it was Christians who saw that uh, men were created in the image of God. So there was Christians who disagreed that the Bible taught, taught that and they're the ones who would uh, abolish slavery. Yeah, but it was also Christians that kept it going for so long, too. But you, gotta, I was, you have to admit that. I, but it's right I, there, dude, I, in I, several I, sections. Actually just I just want to interject something real quick that's important, is that... Father of Christ. When you, you see, you're saying there... I, I don't want to misrepresent your worldview, but did you, you said that you do believe there's a God? No, I don't. Okay, let me say this, that... You keep using terms like this is wrong and this is bad and this is evil. Yeah. But, but by what standard? So let me ask you. I also say it's Thursday. You're going to say Thor's, uh, Thor's all right too? Well, let me ask you a question. Follow me here. This is really important for everybody to listen. All right. Okay. You're saying things like slavery or murder is wrong. So let me just ask you a question. Ready? Is murder wrong? Yes. That's it depends. What? If well, you come into my house, you're dead. Right. Okay. But let's just say the murder. Is the murder well, an that's just that's just if you come in and you know as a as to do something okay, bad. Let him, let him just, I, I welcome to my house. I, I break Stick bread with, with you. Right? Stick with <laughs> me, dude. Okay. Right. Is the murder of an innocent child wrong? You say yes. Says who? The in, the murder of an innocent child. Yes. Who well, says God it? would be okay with that because according to your book, didn't he drown everybody in that big flood? But I'm asking you a question. No, 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 no. I'm asking you. you God thinks it's okay. To me, it's not because you know I'm more moral than your than your God. But who says who says you, you're still missing something because you're borrowing from the Christian worldview to disprove them? 
who says murder's wrong? I'm asking you a question. Who said, uh, myself, my uh, prefrontal lobe. Let me say this, that if, if you're the one who determines whether murder's right or wrong, then you can't say someone else is wrong if they decide to murder somebody. So if I said, hey, I decide murder's right, then you can't tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, I can. If Society they, will make a rule about that and say, hey, that's wrong, dude. Oh, so society determines whether murder is right or yes. wrong. So slavery oh, wasn't wrong. Depends on the situation. Hold on. Hold on. If I killed you on the street just because I felt like killing somebody, wrong. But if you, you were going to injure a child, hey, all bets are off, dude. Listen, so now you shifted and said society determines that murder is wrong. And watch this. Yeah. If society determines if murder is right or wrong, then everything Hitler did is, was, was right in your eyes. Because Actually, the society of Nazi Germany Germany uh, literally fought a war Hitler did was not right. Topic. You just right. said society okay. determines what's right or wrong. So now you're changing your position again. Who determines? No, I'm not. That that's wrong. What Hitler did to the not, to the to the uh, Jews was wrong. What God did to those kids uh, during the flood was wrong. Who says who says what Hitler did to the Jews was wrong? Says who? Society and the history books. Not his society. Not his. My so society said. My society is saying that what God did to those kids was wrong too. So. Society so what part are you playing, son? Are you on the part that's an evil? Or are you going to play the part that's a good? Are you, are you saying that if you were in Germany that you would say, hey, I am going to kill some Jews? Because that's what I'm hearing from you. No, you're missing it. No, you're misrepresenting me. What I'm saying is if you say society determines whether murder's right or wrong, then everything Hitler did, you can't say that they're wrong because that society determined it was right or wrong. Yeah, and like I said, my society right now is saying that was wrong. Just like so my your society, society is standard. saying... That so, when God killed those kids, it's wrong. When he killed all the firstborns in Egypt, that was wrong, too. Your worldview can't allow you to say that. that Good. So then your worldview cannot allow you to say you're right. You cannot uh, assert your belief onto us and saying that you're right. You have to prove to us that you are right. You just well, let can't me, assert that. Let me I'm, finish glad you brought that up. I'm glad I'm using your words against you. Now, let me finish this thought real quick, that right. in the Nuremberg trials, uh, the Nazi generals were put on world stage, and you had the world putting these Nazi generals on trial. And the Nazi generals, their defense, right, was that everything we did was legal. Our society said it was okay. And you had these other societies that were saying what you did was wrong. So they said everything we did was legal. Our society said it was okay. How can you try us? And the court shut down for two weeks. Because that's the problem. Now listen. And, watch. and note that the Nuremberg defense, they were still found guilty. Now listen. The reason they, the court had to, to shut down for two weeks and it reconvened, and the only way they could try them, they said, we appeal to a law higher than societies. We appeal to the law higher than all. They had to appeal to a universal standard in order to try them. And here's the problem you have, is that when you say things are good and evil, you're appealing to a universal standard and a, and a, and a lawgiver. So it's, you're borrowing from the Christian worldview to try and argue against no, God. Because right. if we went through there, we could say, hey, you know what? Those Jews deserved it because they killed Christ. No, right? Christian what says that. that. What Christian argues that? Wow, look at Mel Brooks, in, dude. None in this Have you story. not seen? Okay, but we don't base uh, if a religion is true or not based off of those who fall, no, fail no, no, to no, follow no, the teaching. Thank goodness. No, no. No, no, I, I brought up that point, and you guys have to defend that because who hate who? I mean, the, 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 according to a lot of Christians, they do not like Jews. Look at the Nazis. They were Christians. The swastika used to be a holy Christian symbol. You can say no. Hitler was not a Christian. Holy Christian symbol. No. Excuse me. Well, I think uh, the, was a Catholic, actually. The, the issue is Again, you don't determine whether a viewpoint Catholics is true. Are Christians. Hold on, guys. Not all, not all Christians are Catholics. That's another topic. But the thing we're saying here is you don't determine whether a viewpoint is true if someone is inconsistent with the original teachings. Jesus himself is a Jew, so that doesn't make sense for Christians to hate Jews, and obviously we are called to love our enemies as oh, Christians. Okay, so let's let's go. Let's do some of your history. Okay, who were the ones that went and told Pontius Pilate we should um, put this guy on a cross? It was Jews. When you look at Mel Gibson's story, he plants some. All, he plants all that on the Jews. Okay, Mel Gibson is not the authoritative on, standard for Christians. So we're going to have to kind of move forward because the, right. um, also because of our time limits. I appreciate the engaging conversation, guys. I right, to, I'm a little, yeah. No, you're fine, man. Um, hey, I don't I, think we have to be afraid of, of conversation because I think 
we're told too much in society to avoid um, topics that are of great importance. And so that's not going to help anyone in refining what is not consistent logically and what cons corresponds to reality. Um, these are conversations we should be having yeah. and not, not avoiding. So um, again, if we stick to the, the topics and the issue, uh, I was going to correct myself. I said Irenaeus, it was true, and he was saying um, the apostles' writings are still around, and that was 180. I put that in the the uh, text box there. Um, so we're going to have to wrap up uh, here in a second. I want to give you guys, uh, there's about 13 what we call extra biblical sources in relation to um, people who are Roman historians, uh, other uh, historians, politicians who quoted different facts about Jesus' life. You have Tacitus lived between 56 and 117 AD. He said, Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Um, we also have Phlegon and Africanus um, quoting the total eclipse when Jesus was crucified. There's several other quotes uh, like Pliny that is worth going through. And these are guys who are no fan of Christianity. Pliny, Roman author administrator, in his letter to Trajan in uh, 112, he's talking about how early Christians worshipped Christ um, early on. Um, and I th so I think those are issues that need to be looked at. Uh, as far as people who are enemies, uh, hold on, let me finish. Hold on, let me finish, please. Uh, these are people who were not fans of Christians. They will affirm the major details that Jesus lived, that he died, that his disciples were proclaiming that he is risen from the dead, um, that he did miracles, that he is a wise teacher. Even the Jewish Talmud affirms that as well. Um, so yeah. I think you have Give to consider. The so they may read them. Okay, hold on, I'm not done. Says, these people believe these things. Right. And that's the thing. These are enemies affirming the key facts because no, if it did enemies affirming that people believe these things at, at no point did any of them say, and this is so they said, and there are these Christians and these are their beliefs. And, you know, and this is how they are. This is their number. This is from where they hail. And uh, Christus and has name had its origin and Josephus affirmed the existence of well, Christus, uh, Christus had his name in, in the term Christ, meaning Savior, and there were thousands of Christs in the, in the Judaic area in those centuries. It was a common thing to be an end times preacher, much like it is today. And today, they, you know, then they called them Christ. Today, they usually, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know, what, what is a good term we use for them nowadays? Usually, they get scoffed at on the street when they preach apocalypse. Uh, well, I think that's the difference, though, because, again, people will die for what they think to be true, but no one's going to die for what they know is a lie, and the early disciples were in the best position for that. Well, I appreciate the dialogue, guys. We're going to have to wrap it up for the day. i got to get back with my kids, and I'm sure several other of you guys do as well. Um, hopefully, we can continue certain uh, conversations and unravel these some more.